So hello and good morning to day number four. It's the final day of the AAIC 2021. I'm Clemens Wassler from AI Austria and with me here on the stage is Matthias Grabner from Advantage Austria. Yeah, we had a three day program already. Now is day four, uh, a day which I'm really looking forward to because we have uh, really saved up some highlights for you today. Because today we talk about what's next in AI. And that entails several interesting panels and presentations, mm -hmm. Clemens. So starting with uh, investors, because uh, putting the money where the book will go. So obviously we ask investors for that. And so we're very happy to welcome a, a large investor round for, for our first panel. Uh, later today, we will also have uh, uh, participants from the research side joining us. Mr. LSDM himself, Mr. Hochreiter, will give a talk uh, shortly after, after lunchtime. AI so, pioneer, Sepp Hochreiter, most cited AI paper in the world. If you are in AI, you know him. And if you're not, we will repeat that once again, that he's really one of the highlights. Mm -hmm. So without further hesitation, I would like to hand over the word to Andre Redrat from Early Bird Ventures VC, who is hosting the uh, venture capitalist and investor panel. So Andre, the stage is yours. Good morning, Andre. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Clemens and Matthias, for handing over and also for giving us the chance to host this panel here. I'm super excited uh, to also welcome uh, my fellow panelists. We have a diverse field of panelists uh, from UDIT, La Familia, investing in the pre-seed and seed stages, Ben from Atomico, investing Series A onwards, and Drew from Besma Venture Partners, investing across stages. And most interestingly, most of the investors on the panel also invest across geographies. So I'm super excited to hear about their perspectives about investing in AI. For the next 45 minutes, we will cover the hottest trends in AI, why Europe might be ahead or behind in AI, and what investors are really looking for across stages and geographies when they invest in AI. To start with, um, I'd like to introduce myself briefly before handing over to the other panelists. So I'm Andre, I'm a principal at Early Bird Venture Capital. Early Bird is a pan-European venture firm with a 24-year history of investing in seed or Series A stage companies like UiPath, N26, Mava, Ivan, and many more. We currently invest from four different funds uh, with a total volume of a bit more than 700 million. And we particularly like to invest in very tech-centric businesses. So I'm super excited about this panel specifically. Personally, I'm, uh, I'm a mechatronics engineer, um, worked a bit more than five years in industry, working mainly on predictive maintenance before I left to study management and doing my PhD in the intersection between computer science and finance on the topic of machine learning in VC. And I joined Early Bird a bit more than three years ago and heading now our AI-focused investment practice. So enough about me, handing over to, our, to my fellow panelists. Judith, why don't you start with a quick intro? Thank you so much, Andre. So my name is Judith. I'm a general partner at La Familia. We are a Berlin-based early stage fund investing across Europe um, and the US. Our focus is finding the next best B2B focused disruptive companies that enable or disrupt large industries. A lot of that focus actually is on AI companies and we've made a, a couple of fantastic investments across different countries in Europe um, and also the US. Um, I first caught the bug of machine learning and big data back at university um, at the Internet Institute and have been focused on, you know, finding the next best automation and um, disruptive company in that space ever since. Cool. Thank you. Ben, why don't you go next? Thanks, Andre, and thank you very much for having me today. Uh, I'm Ben. I'm partner at Atomico. Um, Atomico is a generalist venture fund based uh, in London and really focused on helping to um, back and, and scale Europe's most ambitious and visionary entrepreneurs. Um, we invest um, across Europe, um, we invest across stages, so anything from Series A and onwards, and we you know, really look for companies doing all kinds of things, right from consumer internet through to kind of very deep and frontier technology. I am a partner on our early stage B2B team, so I look across B2B, but really have a, a kind of passion and interest for companies that are using hard technologies like AI, like machine learning, simulation, and, and other things to tackle big and thorny problems in traditional industries. Um, and, you know, I think that if you look across the board, you know, machine learning and AI are some of the most advanced and developed and powerful technologies for, for doing that today. Um, 
Atomico has a, a kind of wide ranging AI machine learning portfolio. So everything from um, semiconductors like GraphCore that are really you know, powering this technology at scale through to applications in healthcare and autonomous vehicles in um, Industry 4.0 and, and many other areas as well. So you know, it's a big theme we've been investing against for a number of years. And you know, my own background was as a software engineer originally. And um, so, yeah, you know, always exciting to see the technology from the, the kind of fundamentals and then you know, see it out in the wild and the, the opportunities it can create. Thank you so much, Ben. Last but not least, Drew. Hey, my name is Drew. Um, I'm an investor at Bessemer Venture Partners. Uh, we, you know, we're a global multi-stage firm, so we invest um, across, you know, across the U.S., Europe, uh, Israel, India, and China. And um, we we typically focus on um, investing in early stage companies. So, you know, seed, Series A, Series B is, is most of our focus, but we can also write, you know, larger checks. And, um, and you know, I think. We're very focused on soft, in, in particular, I'm very focused on, you know, enterprise, uh, SMB, vertical software, a lot of these like B2B software categories where for a while, I think the focus was on just bringing a basic system of record to a lot of these industries and, and sort of the next generation of what we're seeing. So we call that kind of vertical software, vertical application software or, or you know, infrastructure software. But now we're, we're even more excited about is that I think over the next decade, um, we're seeing just a lot of uh, a lot of opportunity to build on top of those existing kind of software 1.0 systems and and automate them and that's where i think a lot of this ai uh you know technology is going to be really exciting so um you know i'm based in london and we we have a new office here we're focused on investing like i said globally but we we do specifically spend a lot of our time looking at early stage you know b2b focused companies in europe as well and um and yeah our, our portfolio is pretty pretty broad but Within AI, you know, we've invested on the you know all the way on the hardware and chip side. Companies like Habana Labs, more applied vertical companies like Shift Technologies in Paris, for example, in the insurance space, and uh, and several others. So look forward to diving in and learning more about it today. Cool. Thank you so much, Drew. Let me quickly double click on one thing you said. So you said uh, you're specifically looking into verticalized um, enterprise mm -hmm. software. Can you contextualize that on AI specifically? So if you think about AI, horizontal um, platform technologies versus verticalized AI integrators, how do you think about that? And what are you specifically lo looking for in terms of AI, vertical versus horizontal? Yeah, great question. Um, I would love to hear everyone else's thoughts too. I think um, one of the reasons or ideas behind vertical versus horizontal for us has been that um, oftentimes it seems, you know, it would seem like a verticalized data set is more robust to actually build some sort of a learning system on top of. Um, so I think, you know, for example, our company Shift Technology in the claims automation and, and insurance space, you know, they, they focus so, so specifically on insurance and insurance claims that they have a lot of data in that in that category that I think that gives them kind of an advantage when they're building their um, you know, when they're building their their sort of systems for automation, um, I I, <clears throat> I think it's possible to in other categories. Like there's there's companies that have done this on like Gong, for example, is a company that I've you know admired, but we were not investors in. That's focused more on like a sales use case and seems to have really focused again on like a verticalized approach. And so it just it just sort of seems like we've seen that first kind of pop up. I don't I don't think that's the only opportunity, but it just sort of from what from what I've seen, like it, it seems like a very practical use first use case of of automation because you have an, enough data to really actually you know build some sort of a feedback loop within the within the area you're you're working on. But would love to hear what other people have if, if anyone else has specific thoughts on that too as well. Yeah, happy to jump in. I would I would subscribe to everything that you've said. I think you know also in our portfolio we've invested into some companies like Cloud and C, you know that are using AI to basically automate CNC milling alongside Atomico, but also other companies that are more in kind of focused on document extraction, automation within insurance, similar to to Shift. And I think very often it's it's easier within the enterprise context to offer deep value extraction when you are focused on a vertical and you when you really go down into 
that workflow and you, you know, try and capture more value as you grow the product. I think when you have a horizontal solution, the big challenge is you need a very, very strong technology foundation to start with because you need to have, you know, like a, a really, really strong model, lots and lots of data to be able to offer that horizontal value proposition. And then there's obviously always the question of, you know, why couldn't any of the big platforms out there be eating into your market at, at some point? You know, why would this would this piece of cake be defensible against other, you know, more horizontal players, especially in the cloud space? you know that are also trying to capture the more horizontal use cases i think nonetheless you know there are, is a lot of opportunity still left in that market we've invested into a couple of companies from empira that are you know quite you know, broad when it comes to document um extraction across different verticals um or also abacus ai but i would say that all of those teams you know had kind of you know a super long track record in ai they came with you know kind of 20 machine learning engineers that they were able to hire so i think it takes a certain kind of clout and maybe not necessarily you know the the leanest approach when it really comes to to go to market which i think lends itself a lot more to the vertical use case and thus also something that we tend to see more when it comes to the european early stage companies where we just don't yet have you know the big tradition of you know tons and tons of ml engineers that have been working at the likes of google and facebook that can then spin out and you know kind of try and come up with a competing offering in those sectors Maybe one slightly different take on 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 what I you know I agree with with the others on on, on the same kind of things, but um, you know if you look at horizontal AI businesses, um, I, I always find you're looking at a trade off between simplicity and power. So if you're trying to take you know these very powerful technologies and provide them as a kind of as a platform or as a product into to business, either you're really dumbing them down for a kind of non-technical user or a kind of business line user, in which case you're sacrificing a lot of power or flexibility, or, you know, at the other end of that spectrum, you know, you're basically providing the, the kind of the open source tools that are out there that are, you know, so fantastic, tends to flow and other things, you know, in, in some kind of hosted format, in which case, um, you know, the, the, the developers you're selling to are sophisticated enough, they might as well, you know, take and run and manage their own products in, 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 in many cases. And, you know, there's good exceptions and things like Ivan to, to how people think about that. But that, you know, I, I more often than not, I've, I've seen businesses that kind of fall in the wrong place on that spectrum where you, are, you either lose too much or you're exposing too much. And, and so really, you know, for horizontal AI businesses, I think it's much harder to figure out who is the user and who is the, you know, the ideal customer for these. Um, I think, you know, with vertical businesses, because you're selling to a business user and because you're, you know, you can you can get you can combine power and simplicity through you know very well defined use cases of of that technology i think you you have less of those kind of challenges and questions to deal with just to follow up on that ben so you said sometimes they they find themselves in the wrong positioning um if you think about positioning in terms of horizontal versus vertical on the horizontal side we obviously see more research heavy, more tech centric businesses. And on the vertical side, we on the other hand side see more um, integrators, um, how I like to call it. Um, they uh, focus on specific industries. They need to understand the whole value chain within a specific industry. Now, this is a completely different characteristic set for um, different kind of companies. So I assume that's why you said they find themselves in the wrong positioning. Do you have a specific preference for either or horizontal versus the vertical? I, I wouldn't say I have a, a kind of preference. You know, personally, I spend more of my time looking at vertical and applied AI businesses. Um, I, you know, as a kind of, you know, primarily as a software investor and looking at the size of problem that is left to solve in many enterprises and many industries, I kind of, I like to see how these technologies can be applied and, 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 and kind of used to kind of unlock unlock value and, and justify the justify spend on those technologies because of the value you're creating in it against an industry problem. Um, but I think, you know, as a as an organization, as a team at Atomico and across the industry, I think you know there are there are still great horizontal businesses, whether you're talking about chips or or the kind of enabling platforms of these other businesses. I think, you know, the great thing about building a vertical AI business now is you don't have to start from, you know, you don't have to start implementing neural nets from from kind of first principles, you've got all this infrastructure that other people have built to implement on. So there's, you know, as, as with all these things, there's incredible value in, in being the pieces of the stack as well as the, um, as well as the applications at the top. 
And speaking about the differentiating factors, so uh, oftentimes people say that in verticalized AI, you <coughs> you see uh, commercial traction earlier than you will see for the horizontal platforms because these horizontal platforms are a bit more complex to put together. It's more research heavy until you productize that and really can generate the commercial traction. So how do you think about uh, the importance of commercial traction when investing in AI centric businesses more generally? You did at the earliest stages. How, you, how do you think about it? I think it really depends on the type of company and the type of problem they're solving, right? I think you know, we've got companies that are trying to build, you know, kind of the GPT-3 of Europe. And it's pretty clear that, you know, they're not going to come with tons and tons of traction initially. Um, when it comes because that's a really bold vision and that takes a lot of money and a lot of you know kind of work you know uh, behind closed doors in order to get anything up and running that's that's going to be of high performance and so you know i do think it's important that as venture capitalists we also back these types of businesses and obviously traction is amazing that's fantastic that needs to be valued and and you know that's great and that's as you said obviously easier in the in the vertical use cases but i think at the same time especially when it comes to european investors there's been somewhat of a you could say malaise you know when it comes to you know, not necessarily funding the more researchy, you know, kind of long term bets that I do think we need to be investing in. And so, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's our mandate to, you know, invest in both types of categories. And I do think there's been quite a shift in thinking of the last five years, you know, when it comes to, you know, funds also embracing the more kind of, you know, fundamental businesses that might take a little bit longer to go to market, but that are equally important and you know who will see the kind of you know value uptick just a little bit later in their life cycle but then you know have a chance of of exploding and you know like um you know like uh, you know the others we've also invested in grok for example which is a u.s company in the in the ai chip space you know i think these companies you know there's a lot of work that goes into them you know a lot of a lot of you know long long hard hours and you don't hear from them for too long but then you know they come up with a fantastic new new result with a fantastic new chip and it was kind of you know all worth it but i do think you know it needs investors that are able to kind of follow that vision and not kind of press companies on showing traction from day one um because i think that's that's what we certainly i think have enough of in europe and i'd rather like to see us having more of the fundamental tech bets as well thank you you did Drew, how do you think about it? Also investing across the stages, uh, do, do, do you differentiate in terms of horizontal versus vertical? What traction is required so that Bessemer dives deeper? Yeah, it's a pretty, it's a big question. I, I, I don't know that I have like a good answer similar to everyone else on like horizontal versus vertical. I think when you're looking at horizontal, I always just ask like, you know, why has it, why can't Google do this? Why can't Amazon do this? Why can't Facebook do this? And usually those teams have like huge resources devoted to these problems. And so like what I'm really looking for is a good answer to that question it is, is, you know, why has this team been able to figure out something with a small group of people that's going to be enduring and a competitive advantage to what Google's, you know, 500 ML engineers are working on, in, you know, across the world. And, and it's difficult. That's part of the reason it's, it's challenging. But I think to, to do this point, like we would probably rather take a bet in a, in a really strong, fundamentally differentiated technology early, so maybe even before they have a product or before they have a lot of traction, um, and, and and we'd like to make that bet. But if it's something that's more more you know less differentiated, then we'd like to probably see a lot more revenue traction because otherwise it's difficult for us to say. So I think like one example maybe like again to her to her point around like the, the sort of the chip infrastructure space. I think that's like a highly differentiated uh, technology. And so like we made it in very, we made a seed, I, I believe it was a pre-product or seed investment in a company called Habana Labs, which is, you know, an AI chip company. And um, the bet was that they're, in, they're, they're actually designing something like fundamentally different from, you know, Intel and some of the other big chip manufacturers. And so I, I'd love, to, we'd love to take bets like that. They're, they're pretty rare though. Um, and so we, we don't come across them that often, but um, I think otherwise, this question of like, how are you, you know, how are you different from what Google and Amazon and, and these big AI companies with huge, huge teams are doing is like a key question for me always as I look at like the horizontal ones, um, which is less, I guess, less of a problem for the vertical ones because they, they're owning a category that they can actually be better than, than say the Google or generic ML platform. And I think yeah, in, thank you. 
in all transparency, it's also it's also a problem that's getting harder, right? When it comes to like the marginal, um, you know, improvements of AI, like those are getting more and more expensive. And so I think there is a real question to be asked of, you know, if you're a pre-seed company, um, you know, what's your unfair insight and what's your unfair advantage when it's not just, you know, the poor, the pure kind of, you know, brute cash force that you have, which, you know, the big tech tech companies need tend to have, but the, the early stage companies, you know, do struggle with. And so I, I do think that's a relevant question that, that seed funds are struggling with when it comes to making investments in the horizontal, more research, you know, longer term um, bets. And that's, let, let's dive a bit deeper into um, the fundamental disruptions, as you drove said, and the hottest topics uh, in AI. You did you spoke about GPT-3. I remember, Ben, you wrote a, a blog post in 2017 why, why AI is now on the menu at dinner. Um, and you spoke about the hottest trends back then and that it really surpassed the IoT wave and that AI is now really a buzzword. So how do you think about the hottest trends within AI and then really hype versus real fundamental disruption then? Um, that's, uh, that's some good kind of background reading. Um, I, yeah, I think that the, the point I was making back then was really around exactly that it was around this this topic becoming such a hyped topic there was you know the whether it was you know elon musk or um you know others there was yeah it was it was the kind of bitcoin of today in terms of what people were kind of tweeting about and memeing about on twitter um and i think you know that the subtle subtext of that was that people were there was a lot of kind of fear being generated around the impact of ai you know you know, every article, every sort of semi-serious article about AI had like a Terminator movie screenshot as the as the kind of the, the headline banner image on on the article, and I you know I think it was it was capturing the public's imagination, but it was wasn't being very helpful in its conflation of kind of AI with these scary robots that change the world. Um, I think now we are you know encouragingly more and more past that where you can read press coverage about AI, you can see these technologies covered in, in the media and, and on the news, um, and you can you know, get real cut through of the positive benefits you know, in, in healthcare, in construction and manufacturing, in, um, you know, in these other big areas that people realize need to be improved because you know, of the state of the economy, the state of world health. Um, and so I think you know, I could probably say that we're past that hype phase and into the point now where um, you know, as we've all talked about, the, the ver as more companies focus on vertical applications of these technologies in, in many and in, in many wider areas, and the the promise of the technology starts to really realize itself because we're not just seeing these you know the earlier stage companies with ideas, but we're really seeing some of these companies mature and, and kind of manifest and, and have these technologies displayed at last uh, at, at kind of scale. I think you saw. I, I think maybe this is the best of my company, but Tractable, a European company um, that just announced this huge deal with Geico this week about you know processing claims with AI at massive scale. You know, you start to see things like that, or you know, within many of our own portfolio companies, um, a company I work with, Automation Hero, that has you know many many great customers doing large scale AI deployments now. Um, you know, the the potential is realized, and so you know, as as a kind of as a kind of headline trend about what's hot, I think really the AI and the space around AI has moved on from calling out these kind of hot ideas into you know maturing as a technology to the point where you know what's hot is really the the impact and the applications we're seeing. And just and just and just to become a bit more specific on that, so if I look at companies like literally every company puts the AI tech on their pitch deck, yeah, we're doing some kind of AI, even though it's very narrow AI, just very supervised, essentially just regressions. Yeah, so is this statistics, is this AI? So AI is very fuzzy buzzword. And uh, within AI, you can have multiple definitions of machine learning versus AI, the cognitive areas, and so on. So if you would need to pick, like, let's say, two or three of the hottest trends within the huge AI bucket, mm. Ben, how, how do you think about that? Yeah, I smile because we just invested in a company called Pactum in Estonia. And the, the CTO of Pactum was formerly head of computer vision at Starship, the small autonomous robot. So he like has this kind of pure machine learning background of doing computer vision for these robots. And then at Pactum, he's very clear that he's building AI, but he's not, you know, the fundamental technology is not all machine learning. There's a bunch of other techniques. So I think you know, what we're seeing is a, is, a, is a diversification of techniques that you could call AI. And I think, you know, the truth is that AI as a term is not strictly defined, right? It is, you know, machine learning, let's say, is a set of specific techniques. And I think, you know, 
someone touched on it, I think Judith touched on it before, but I think actually what's exciting with machine learning is that there are still you know, cutting edge research groups pushing the potential of machine learning and introducing new, new techniques at the edges that will improve machine learning over time. I think you know, we saw a faster acceleration in machine learning subfield developments probably for a period of five or six years. And I think you know, new things will, will inevitably take you know, more time to mature and you know, also be linked to new hardware architectures. But I, you know, I spend a lot of time looking at things like um, massive scale simulation and generative design. And you, know, you may or may not argue that these things are AI, but if you, if you kind of group this kind of wider set of technologies under AI, um, then I think there are lots of areas where you know, computers will show intelligence either through some combination of you know, brute force and heuristics or machine learning or, or, or otherwise. But um, yeah, a long answer to a question, but maybe, maybe kind of for me, si simulation um, is, is definitely a very kind of powerful technology right now. Thank you. And investing at the earliest stages of, of, of startups and companies, uh, Judith, tell us what, what will be the hottest in the next few years when we look at it at Series A, Series B+. Plus. So I think for us, very clearly, 2019 and 2020 were kind of the years of NLP. And we saw some like fantastic breakthroughs where I think before, you know, it was always kind of uh, you know, the, the, the tech wasn't quite there. And of course, you know, you had some, you know, real progress in like translation and some use cases, but really when it comes to like the broader applications, you know, that was really still more of a horrible experience than a great experience. And I think on the research side, we've made some fantastic progress over the last couple of years. And that's really showing, you know, kind of results now and coming to fruition. I think going forward, we're probably going to see, you know, new advances also in computer vision, you know, and, and some other areas. But I think for us, certainly, you know, exciting NLP advancements have been kind of the, the the buzzwords that we got most excited about. And I think to the point that you made around, you know, lots of companies kind of, you know, putting the AI, AI tech on, on their decks, I, I think that's okay, right? I think, you know, of course you've got the types of companies that, you know, have like, you know, pure machine learning teams and like, you know, AI is at the core of their value proposition. But I think it's great that there's other companies, you know, that, you know, don't necessarily come from kind of a pure AI background that are still able to, you know, kind of harbor these technologies and still do something with them, right? I think it's it's one, you shouldn't even sell yourself as like a pure AI company. Like that's obviously, that's obviously, obviously a stupid thing to do. But I think, you know, overall, the democratization of AI is something that we should celebrate as, as the venture industry. And, you know, not something that we should say is only reserved to, you know, an exclusive group of people, you know, that have 20 years experience doing this. But I think overall, it speaks, you know, to the to the kind of you know maturity that, that Ben also mentioned in the beginning of this technology and now becoming more widely accessible in terms of solving all types of problems, even if it's just you know kind of you know automating an invoice or automating like a small part of, the, of a process that at, at the end of the day is still going to drive efficiency for a company and still going to help them in terms of you know bringing the value proposition that they want to achieve um, forward. So it's on on the investors to look through all the buzzwords and understand if there's really something fundamental. So it's okay to start up through the window dressing, but it's our job to dive deeper and understand what's the fundamental the breakthrough. It's okay, to, it's okay to think about how you can use AI, right, to, to, to solve company problems. And I don't think you need to be NII founder in order to do that, right? I, I do think there is enough democratization for other companies to also now start using this tool set, but you should still be true about, you know, what the what the core of your value proposition is. I see Dhruv nodding here. What what do you think about that, Dhruv? Investing also in the later stages um, in, in the AI companies. Um, how do you think about the hottest trends and what you did just said? Yeah, that, first of all, I think the NLP comment was really interesting. I was going to say something similar. Um, but what we what we noticed, like especially at the later stages, is that it's kind of ironic that we talk a lot about these like very deep technologies, but at the later stages, the companies that seem to succeed are just making like tiny improvements and they go a long way. Um, I think a lot about like these, 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 you know, automated invoices or, or automated, you know, sales processes are just reading a transcript and being able to tell someone what what's on that transcript from a call, from a call you have with a customer. I mean, it's kind of like sort of seems like pretty basic stuff to me, but um, it's just such low hanging fruit. So I think before we get into like really interesting use cases of AI, we have to go through all these like basic use cases of like, being able to understand what's going on in a conversation, being able to understand what's in an image. And like, there's just so many business applications for those things that haven't even been, you know, haven't been done. I still use, you know, terrible business software for pretty much every part of my job. So I think, you know, I still have to manually add, 
receipts to my expense report and things like that, and, and it doesn't recognize it. So I think, um, you know, I get excited about all the early stage technology, but I think what's even more for me is like, even as we look at the later stages of investing is just like very specific value propositions with a clear, like, hey, this improved my workflow by 20%. It's like a huge thing in the bit, in the, especially in, I think in the business world, it's it's amazing. Um, I think a lot of these like robotic process automation startups have sort of started to take take on some of these really you know mundane tasks as well. I don't know if we'll group that as, into AI or not, but I think that's another area that we've been sort of watching and, and interested in. Um, but but I agree that some of the most early stage exciting stuff for me seems to be around what we're seeing with the advancements in like conversational, uh, you know, the ability to, to build these like conversational platforms where you have, um, you know, you have bots or human or, you know, replacing the human, for example, in a conversation. And it's a little scary, but I think it's also, again, it could save huge amounts of costs in areas like customer success or, you know, these, these, um, these big call centers, for example. So I think we're probably going to see a lot of automation and, and uh, opportunities to use AI there. And we've already invested in a couple of companies, um, but but that seems to be the one. And then I think the other the other like computer vision that was also mentioned. I think we were seeing some interesting applications of that. But one thing that I've always found challenging is it's difficult to know the progress of each of these individual technologies. It's difficult to know where we are in deep learning research, and if we if we're hitting like a trend, you know you know a plateau, or if we're, we're just keep you know for a while people are very excited about deep learning. And, and I think one, one of the things that's challenging is that early stage investors to figure out, you know, are we really breaking through here or is this just incremental improvement over the last like six years? And that's uh, that I don't know. <laughs> that's, a, that's a really tough question. To also double click on your first point, uh, speaking about efficiency, humans versus bots. How do you, Ben, think about uh, human in the loop? How comfortable are you still with human in the loop? Because as investors, obviously, we want to improve the margins. Yeah, we want to remove the humans in the loop. How do you think about that? It's a very interesting question. I was thinking about this when you were with one of the questions you asked the others earlier on. So yeah, one of the things about being a vertical AI company or an industry-specific AI company and, and you know how you can maybe get started quicker is because of things like human in the loop and things like, you know, having a product that will eventually be AI powered, but um, where you can have a much simpler version of it or use simpler technologies earlier on to go to market quicker, get in the hands of customers and, um, you know, learn with your customers what they need and then learn how best to apply and develop the most, you know, the more advanced technologies to, to kind of meet that need. So I think there is a, you know, there's a positive side to using some of these techniques in the kind of, you know, whether it's human in the loop, whether it's um, just, you know, using simpler versions of these technologies to start with in, in terms of, you know, in, in, more, in more complex industries or in industries that are, you know, less used to adopting new technology. So just getting out there, getting the product in the hands of customers and then being able to co-develop with them as a company, but also to, you know, fund some of your growth through revenue as well as through, um, you know, venture funding. Um, but I think you need to have a clear plan for, well, I think you need to have a clear plan for kind of how that's going to ramp down over time in order to convince, to still convince investors who are relatively single minded that in the end, this stuff should be more scalable. Um, I think, you know, it's an interesting question. And I think we should all be challenged on our, on our kind of pattern recognition a bit. I think there are companies that I've seen who are kind of comfortable with the level of human in the loop they have and, you know, see that as just part of the model and see that as part of the cost. And they're not delivering 90% plus margin software. They're delivering 70% plus margin software because that human component is just always a part of it for double checking or for catching the, you know, the anomalous results or, or whatever else. And so I think what inevitably happens is we're all seeing just more and more, more and more investors looking for great opportunities is probably those opportunities also become, you know, acceptable ones for investors who are happy to look at and take the risk of that profile of company or, you know, who've had good experiences of, of scaling large in the loop kind of teams of, of humans to do that. Um, I think there's also interesting business models that we're seeing in terms of outsourcing the human in the loop component. So it just becomes a cost and not an operational constraint as well. And so I think that's also an interesting development there. Wait, wait, which business... 
which businesses specifically are you speaking about? So the first thing which comes to my mind is data labeling, obviously one of the biggest yeah. bottlenecks in the data value chain. Uh, do you have uh, something else uh, in mind? Or no, exactly that kind of thing, you know, whether it's whether it's explicit sort of data labeling startups, whether it's just, you know, more general kind of outsourced, um, you know, outsourced, you know, I mean, uh, Mechanical Turk is like, you know, of course, the kind of the basic example of this, but where where that becomes just a cost and not an operational complexity in in a business then i think it's much easier to get as an investor to go well you know it impacts margin but it's not going to break as we try and you know triple or quadruple or 10x our volume um essentially you know obviously that's that's supplier risk in that you did do you have a perspective on that yeah, I mean, I love I love human in the loop. I think that's great. I think if you find businesses, you know, that work with the human in the loop, you know, I think one of the biggest challenges that we're really running into from a productivity perspective is demographic change, right? And like in 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 some near future, we won't have enough humans to do the work. And if we're waiting for AI to be perfect for the work to be done, then we're going to be waiting for a long time when it comes to solving a lot of the issues out there, right? So I think thinking about human in the loop as a real opportunity rather than a challenge, I think, is, is is the first thing that I that I'd say, and then I think it depends on the underlying problem that you're trying to solve. There are certainly, you know, certain problems where you need next to you know 99.9% you know accuracy and performance in order for that to to work well. You know, drug discovery, for example, if you want to then you know deploy hundreds of millions because of that that you know one molecule that you know is intended to do something else with another molecule, you better be sure that that's actually something that works. Whereas if you, for example, think about fishing, right, like you don't have to catch all the phishing emails, but if you catch 20% more than status quo, that's already, you know, great. So, you know, really thinking about what's the level of shittiness that you can, you know, kind of, you know, that you can accept and the solution's still working great, even if you, you know, we'll still need, you know, a human in the loop in the end, you know, to really kind of perfect the job. I think that's more the, the approach that we're taking. One of my favorite examples is also, um, you know, kind of translation, you know, like for certain tasks, you need 100%, you know, kind of perfection, right? When, you, when you're translating a book. So you're likely gonna have humans in the loop for you know, quite some time before you just you know, let Harry Potter be translated into Chinese you know, just by using AI. But then when it comes to Judith you know, being in China, not speaking a single word of Chinese and suddenly being able to at least be able, you know, read restaurant menus. And yes, it's not perfect, but it's a lot better than what I had before, which was like basically not understanding a single thing. So I really always think about it from the context perspective of what's the level of you know, shittiness and the, and the tech not being quite there yet in terms of, you know, still the value capture and still the, the difference to the status quo and that really kind of, you know, playing into the business case or the, or the problem that you're trying to solve. And that's going to be different for different companies. But human in the loop, I think overall, for a lot of different problems will be a, a great and fantastic way of, you know, getting to real business value. So what you're also implicitly saying is it's first about uh, the required level of accuracy for a specific problem. But second of all, I think it's also about the cost of labor. And I think that also translates uh, into our, our next um, area of questions. When thinking about cost of labor, obviously, it's different if we think about outsourcing in India in Africa or wherever. Um, than it is in Europe, um, but also uh, costs might be different in the US. Yeah? Cost of labor, specifically in the Silicon Valley, hire an engineer and you know what it costs. Hire an engineer in Germany, it's obviously a bit cheaper. Hire an engineer in, I don't know, Southern Europe, it's again cheaper, Eastern Europe. So we have different levels of um, cost of labor. Drew, how do you think about um, AI in Europe versus US, um, considering that you also just expanded into Europe um, recently with your new office and you being here on the ground now? Um, is there something specific in, in mind if you think about companies in Europe versus US? Um, I, I guess it's a question about like talent, like where, where, the, where the talent is, and I think um, for a while, we, we've always felt that there was a lot of a talent, you know, in, in Europe. I mean, um, if you look at some of the university systems in the UK or, or in France, for example, in particular, I think there's a, there's a huge concentration of, of import, you know, impressive talent. I believe like Facebook has a, an AI, you know, had office in Paris, for example. So I think um, one of the key things with AI, it seems to be these days is, is where is the best talent, which I would sort of differentiate from a just software engineers at a lower cost because i think actually probably the people in those those research labs are probably getting compensated at the same rate they are in silicon valley because it's very competitive for that very small set of talent and then outside of that there's a lot of you know very 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 skilled software engineers which is a slightly different um phenomenon but 
I think part of the reason we're excited about Europe is there's so much technical talent here. And, and to me, it, all, it also seems that it, it is, you know, relatively more, um, seems to be better in terms of the, uh, in terms of the labor costs as well. But for the, for the very, like, for the very high end AI talent, I believe it's probably very similar in terms of the, the cost across, you know, the UK, France and, and the US. I um, mean, that it starts to really change as you drop off into the more kind of entry level engineers. But I, I could be wrong about that, but that was just my impression, given that there's so few of these people and they're very specialized and usually working at Facebook or some, you know, some university. Yeah, it's interesting to see uh, how you put together two parts of the equation. On the one hand side, those who build the AI products, like the researchers um, and so on, what you just mentioned. On the other hand side, the people we build these AI products for. So this is what we came from with human in a loop, cost of labor. Yeah. So uh, I think it's it's uh, it's you have better margins and higher cost savings if you improve productivity for people in the US versus uh, if you improve it on an absolute level for people in lower cost, um, lower labor cost uh, countries. Ben, how do you think about um, specifically uh, Europe versus US? And I understand you also invest in, in US, right? In terms of um, AI talent and um, characteristics of AI companies, do you see a difference there and pros or cons in either one ecosystem? Yeah, I mean, on the on the talent point, I think you know, we have a, we have amazing technical universities across Europe. We have um, you know some some of the kind of pioneering groups in lots of of, of these areas. Um, I think that these people have you know the opportunity to work at google or facebook in europe or to move to the us at this point and so the the kind of as, as exactly as you've said the kind of the the cost or, or the cost of labor of, of of that kind of talent is very high um, and probably very comparable i think what we're seeing now is just more and more capital flows into the startup ecosystem in europe is that the cost of any really you know any skilled engineering talent is just going up and up because many, many more companies have more capital than what they need as engineers. And what they're going to spend that capital on is, is kind of paying competitively and for engineers. And that drives, you know, that drives that cost up. And so, you know, the number one topic in all of my board meetings this year or in the last three months, at least, has just been, you know, increasing competitive intensity for, for talent. Um, I think in a way it puts more pressure slash opportunity on building, you know, coming back to this horizontal and vertical point on building tooling that means that less and less skilled engineers can still harness the power of these technologies, which is interesting. But um, I guess the question was about US versus Europe. I think what we're seeing now is that that just becomes a less and less relevant distinction in any, you know, in any conversations or any vector, really. I think, you know, the, the particularly when it comes, you know, specifically when it comes to AI and building AI technologies, I think, We've got just as good talent here. We've got access to the best infrastructure, you know, available through, you know, if that infrastructure has been built in the US, it's available here. And I think what's always been exciting about Europe is the co-location of strong technical talent with strong industrial talent um, in, in different pockets in different places. You know, you look at the strength of the Industry 4.0 um you know, market in Germany, where you've got amazing, amazing technical people with access to you know, the best infrastructure in the world, co-located with, you know, people who had, you know, had, had built careers and built great expertise in, you know, in the world's best engineering and manufacturing companies. And, you know, when those things combine, whether it's, you know, that in Berlin and, and Munich, and whether it's, you know, people from the financial services industry and, and technical talent in, in London, or in, you know, media and, and, in in the Nordics or, or or you know whatever else it is, you know those combinations I think are where Europe has a really strong opportunity to kind of you know outperform on on applied AI really. Thank you, Ben. And just to add another angle to that, and knowing that this is also a, you did your home turf, um, is regulation a good or bad thing um, for AI in Europe? So I think um, regulation is important, and you know that there are certain dangers or challenges, you know, when it comes to AI, um, you know, when it comes to military applications, both an opportunity and a challenge, by the way, I think. But um, overall, I think the ethical implications and, and dangers of AI should be taken seriously. And regulation can be a good mechanism for making sure that, you know, there is trustworthy and, and strong, you know, kind of ethical foundations of uh, the AI companies that we're building. Uh, I think having said that, um, you know, when it comes to European regulation, I do think there's an 
overexcitement when it comes to regulation and an overregulation that tends to happen. So, you know, while I would agree with all the things that Drove and Ben have said, I think overall Europe still is not the number one country when it comes to attracting AI talent, when it comes to, you know, kind of migration policies, when it comes to very, very active, you know, kind of communication in other countries, you know, as to the standard benefits that, you know, that the, the Europe has when it comes to relocating here and starting your business here and, you know, kind of working here. So I think that's something that we can be better on. It's not, it's got some regulatory aspects, but it's also just got some marketing aspects to it. I think the more interesting question is, you know, what is going to be the foundation of AI regulation? And I think the big mistake that we, that we made when it comes to GDPR, which was the last big regulation wave that swept over Europe was there was, um, a heavy discrimination against smaller businesses because at the end of the day they basically said you need to have more documentation right and so if you're google or facebook well guess what it's, it's quite easy to do that because you can hire you know dozens of lawyers and they can take care of that for you so if we're forcing companies to you know kind of go run through all these loops of you know documentation and you know uh, you know, very, very general kind of regulation categories that are, you know, not very use case specific and also speak to all types of AI, not just the kind of high risk, you know, levels of AI when it comes to maybe autonomous driving or, you know, drug discovery, but we're really kind of brushing everything, you know, kind of with the same brush. I think that's then going to be quite challenging for a lot of startups out there that have very limited resources, you know, can't hire tons of lawyers and will really be scared, you know, when it comes to founding a company, because suddenly there's all these different hoops they need to jump through when at the beginning, you know, we all know how iterative the process of even, you know, you know, doing AI or starting a company is when you're really trying different things, you know, you're seeing what works. And, you know, if every time before you, you know, think about, you know, kind of training this model, you know, scaling something up, you know, you need to, you know, be filling out these 10 different forms, you know, that's going to do something to to AI research and AI deployment in Europe. And I, I really hope, you know, I do think there are some strong voices in Europe, you know, that are that are trying to whisper into the ears of the commission. And when it comes to being very use case specific, very, very narrow and concrete in the definitions that we, you know, use AI for and not, you know, just AI as, you know, anything, you know, you know, potentially just statistics and then no one really knows, you know, what, what they're going to end up, you know, doing with all the regulation. I think that that could really be the, the kind of worst scenario that we're running into. Um, and we're going to see some updates coming out next month. And I really do hope that, you know, we've learned from our past mistakes and trustworthy and ethical AI is great. But at the end of the day, the, the big problem we need to work on is just, you know, getting more companies off the ground and and you know too too much regulation really won't help with that thank you so much you did let's see if uh, regulators learn from the past and uh, do better in the future so we are excited about this new update here um we are all, already through with the 45 minutes uh, this was very uh, very exciting discussion and i think we can continue for hours thank you so much for joining us here um i would like to close this session with a one sentence statement from each of you um, starting with AI is, and then you, please fill in. Think about it. Um, Drew, why don't you start, then Ben, and then you did. Okay, putting me on the spot. Um, <laughs> I think probably AI is embedded. I think we're just ne we're never going to know it's AI. You know, the best AI will just be working in the background, and it's probably going to be embedded everywhere. It may maybe it already is. That's it. That's Thank fine. you. Ben? Oh, yeah, I, I, I started going down the wrong thought process. I'm going to make a dangerous, I'm going to, I'm going to make a prediction, which is always very dangerous to do. But let's go with like AI is going to create uh, a trillion dollars of, of economic value over the next decade. Uh, That's a big shot. Thank you. You did. AI is the, the biggest opportunity and not the biggest challenge that Europe has faced in the last decade and in the coming decade. Awesome. Thank you to all three of you. Um, thanks to the audience for listening. I hope you enjoyed the discussion. To all the founders out there who think to start something in AI or related areas, uh, feel free to reach out to all of us. We are super excited to get in touch with you and um, hopefully you enjoyed the discussion. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks for, Thank you for having us. Yeah, and also many mm -hmm. thanks from our side for the panel. And yeah, I, I, I will send you my pitch deck immediately. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Thank you. Best wishes from Vienna. Have a nice day. Thanks. Thanks. All right. And we are a little bit behind time. And that's fine because we move right on to our next keynote, uh, our next presentation. Yes. Live uh, presentation. And let's see if we have a connection to Stefan Nagel of. Round two capital. Hello, Stefan. Can you hear us? 
I can. I hope you can hear me as well. Per perfect. Loud and clear. Loud and clearly. You Very prepared good. some slides for us, which are also already here. And I'd say the stage is yours for your presentation, and we see each other for the Q and A. And uh, reminder to our audience: um, keep on asking questions on Slido or directly at the LinkedIn stream. Um, we will show them and ask them to Stefan in the end. Good. Excellent. Thank you, guys. Um, and I hope that I will be able to keep it somewhat short so that we have sufficient time actually for uh, the Q&A at the end. So uh, basically what I discussed with the organizers is that we talk a bit more in depth about the different business models we see that are more or less connected uh, to AI or have components of AI in them and how we look at them. Before I uh, get into that, um, perhaps introduction. My name is Stefan Nagel. I'm managing partner of Round2 Capital. We are an investment fund based in Vienna. And what we focus on is actually providing um, revenue-based financing to growing companies, uh, predominantly in B2B, predominantly in software as a service business model. So we usually get in at a bit of a later stage when there actually is <coughs> a business model in place, revenue starts to be there. But nevertheless, uh, we actually see a lot of companies that are on the path to reaching that stage and um, basically are then with those companies uh, on the path to growth and actually kind of getting the business models themselves. Uh, before that, I spent a lot of time um, at McKinsey and Company focusing mostly on strategy and corporate finance projects uh, for clients along the whole telecoms value chain. So everything from operators, uh, equipment manufacturers to actually the whole service and application space that sits on top of the networks. And then basically decided uh, I want to engage more in the areas where actually new stuff gets developed and uh, work with younger companies and uh, let, let being an investor and uh, doing what I do. Uh, with Round to Capital, perhaps last uh, sense on that before we jump into it. Uh, we have now more than 20 portfolio companies across Europe, a uh, bit of a focus on the DAC region, but also expanding from that. And as I said, um, the majority of those are actually in B2B and they're in uh, software service. Um, I would say of those companies, between half and two thirds have uh, in one way or the other uh, AI components in their product or use it to actually create value for their customers. So uh, what I wanted to talk about today um, is a little bit uh, ju just providing a very simple and rough framework on how to think about value creation in general, what means uh, for the development or evaluation of business models, and um, then how this relates to business models that are sent around or at least have um, AI one way or the other built in. So I want to talk about that a little bit. Um, and then, of course, uh, in that context, and especially in the life cycle progression of companies and business models, talk about what this means for financing and the different financing instruments available. And then we hopefully have uh, sufficient time uh, to address any questions resulting from that. So let me try to hear, which I can't seem to do. So we across that. Um, basically, I try to always keep things very simple. That does not mean easy, but uh, simple nevertheless. And the couple of uh, questions that I always want to make sure I understand whenever I look at a new company and um, the question that I hopefully under uh, hope the teams are able to express in a very clear and succinct manner are actually those two, right? Number one is how do I actually create value for my customers? And uh, but basically under the consideration that any kind of value that I express is at the end of the day a function of time expressing that in monetary terms uh, is a nice shortcut. A 
how do I actually create value one way or the other, right? The second question is, uh, what can I do that is very hard? So what is really kind of a sustainable, a sustainable skill, a sustainable capability, a sustainable part of the product that I have and that is actually very hard for anybody else to do? around that component of uh, things that I know to do that are very hard, I can build a strategy around that. Because the strategy at the end of the day is less than um, building an approach that allows me to extract part of the value that I've created for my customer over, right, and uh, do that in a profitable manner uh, and actually do that in a sustainable manner so that um, I cannot necessarily be replaced uh, from one moment to the next. So let's get into value creation. And uh, I would ask you to with me very shortly um, on this framework. Uh, on the upper left hand side, basically, we just talk about uh, the value that you create. Um, you create value um, by whatever, saving your customers time, uh, doing something else, reducing costs. You create value. Sorry for that. Um, and then basically from the value that you created, uh, you are hopefully able to, um, to extract uh, of uh, the value for yourself, right? That's a small cutout of the circle. You can value your business model is able to have value for you, be it in whatever kind of uh, pricing scheme uh, that you have developed um, for your customers. And then you multiply that with the number of your customers uh, and that somehow uh, is the value that comes into your business. And then um, those align, what you actually have there is the time and energy that you need to deploy in the business, either yourself or by stuff that you have to do um, from somewhere else and plug in, right? And what is a sustainable business? Well, a sustainable business is uh, a business that over time at least um, makes uh, that equation come out to be larger than one, right? or at least over time, at least uh, the upper part and the lower part become uh, break even, not sustainable, right? Value gets destroyed. So <clears throat> then um, when you think about going further and say, okay, what are then my options uh, to increase uh, the value creation, right? And number one is, uh, of course, I can increase the value that I create for any single customer. What does that mean in practical terms? That means I have um, more features, uh, the features get better, um, uh, usability increases, whatever happens, right? The value that you create for your customer increases. That's option number one. And if then more or less your general uh, value extraction or uh, business model stays the same, uh, as a pie gets bigger, uh, your share itself get, gets bigger. The second, um, you try to increase the value you created that goes actually, right? That's the red number two here. Um, and that basically means, well, my customers have understood actually how much value I create. So I'm actually in a better position to negotiate. I'm able to change my pricing. I'm actually perhaps also able to change um, my model. So I'm no longer charging uh, single license fees or um, user base subscription, but I actually part, take a share of whatever transactions are running across my product. There are tons of different ways, right? But I, I touch the way that I interact with my customer. I, I extract part of what I create for my customer through that manner that increases. Of course, the value for myself increases. We have number three, that basically um, you're simply running the same logic, uh, creating value for more customers. So you get more customers, you multiply it, and all of that 
hopefully at the end of the day works out. So uh, that's where you want to get to, right? You want to have a clear perspective on what kind of value am I creating for my customers? You want to have a clear perspective in terms of how do I extract actually my share of the value that I created? And you want to have a clear perspective on um, how this whole exercise is actually scaling uh, on a customer level. And uh, even without going deep into a discussion around uh, P&Ls, balance sheets, and all the analysis and planning uh, that everybody's doing, uh, if you're not able to express the story of how you create value and how it leads to a sustainable business for yourself, um, that that should be able, from a narrative perspective, be, you should be able to explain in a couple of sentences at the end of the day, right? And that's what I'm always looking for. That's what I try to extract in the first step. I look at pitch decks when I look at anything else. Um, I want to be able for me to understand how this works. Now, of course, um, none of this is set in stone uh, when things get started and depend on the life cycle stage of the business um, overall, right? So when you just get the case, you might have a, again, rough idea of the kind of value uh, you could create with the idea that you have, right? So then, then you get going. And you might have a better idea on the kind of value you create. You might have first ideas on um, basically what the model would look like, how you extract your share of the value you create. And you might have uh, your first set of crazy customers, right? Uh, and then you would get to the stage of achieving product market, basically where it um, becomes more solid. You're actually able to say, okay, yes, I have, can create this value. I have proven that my way of extracting my share of the value works. And uh, I've done that by actually applying it to more. If done that, then um, you can go into scale up and uh, basically focus very much on the um, basically growing the customer base. So that is very simple, right? Uh, in, in that sense, on the other hand side, the doing of it is of course, uh, very hard and of course a strictly linear process because they are uh, built into the whole exercise and uh, you might have to try a couple of times right uh, the test associated to that is however again how clear am I on the different pieces and components of this whole thing um, when I talk myself well when I talk about myself in terms of which state am I actually in? Which state am I actually in? How, how solid are actually the lines in the different pieces of the puzzle? And we, we come back to that because I think, uh, of course, this applies to everything. There are challenges, uh, in my view, with regards to moving through those different stages when it comes to business models that have an uh, AI component or are heavily centered around um creating uh completing technologies or technology applications but before we do that um let me quickly talk about uh, a bit of a perspective of how actually in different business models value gets created uh from ai right the, the business model logic is always the same and yes there are no different rules for business uh anything to do with ai right because still Kind of value needs to get created, uh, value needs to get extracted, and there are no different rules of the game, right? So, but when you think about uh, what, what or value creation can stem from AI in different types of businesses or in, in, in different progressions, then uh, starting from the left, you basically have a pure tech. What I mean by that is um, you have actually come up with a way to do something that could not be done before with data, right? You have a different way of looking at language. You have a new way of uh, analyzing uh, pictures, what have you, right? So there's tech a potentially 
enormous application space and a potentially, from an idea perspective, uh, enormous source of value creation um, if you just take the very broad lens in what could be possible. The second piece as well, uh, the whole uh, fundamental approach is perhaps not new, but what uh, I've actually been able to do is uh, find a way to uh, create better results. Right? So, so I'm creating a better put, um, especially as it relates to whatever I do uh, with uh, the analytical piece of it, the AI piece of it. And better results uh, could mean basically getting things right more often, right? So whenever you think about uh, analysis that have something to do with uh, predictive maintenance, um, any basically uh, decision preparation that gets triggered by um, an AI algorithm and basically making sure that um, the whole results are better in the sense that they are more often uh, right than whatever was there before or they provide a different level of granularity, uh, what have you, right? The output is better. The other source of value creation or differentiation would come from uh, output. And what I mean by that is uh, basically um, overall what I'm trying to do has been done before, but actually I'm able to do this as a completely different scale or I'm able to do this as speed um, or I'm able to do that um, in a much more seamlessly integrated way with anything else that's going on. Right? A, a good example here also uh, for your companies uh, you can have recommendation engines uh, in all different uh, shapes and form, um, but then suddenly, especially talk about video, uh, it becomes a question whether you're on the full scale are able to deliver uh, the recommendation engine results in real time or close to real time or not. Um, different analysis, especially also uh, when you come when it comes to elements like route planning and stuff like that, scale, speed, um, the connectedness matters, right? Even though the analysis itself uh, that that is happening underneath uh, might not be fundamentally new, but the way that it gets applied. So then uh, the, the fourth piece here is where um, what's actually happening is that there is a solution to uh, digitize a piece of a process or uh, su support a specific, very specific, and basically the AI component of it is more or less working in the machine room of the whole exercise. Actually, what you talk about is how process gets supported differently or where um, the resulting product is able to actually enable companies or customers to digitize part of the processes that they could not digitize before. Right? And then last uh, piece on uh, the slide here that in, stands a bit aside in my view, but that is basically a more or less combination roughly of all of the before, but also fundamentally different in the senses. I'm doing something here, I'm creating a product that uh, is actually fully disrupting something on the customer side, right? right? So, so a good example to think about it is uh, when you think about applications in the design or uh, construction space where basically um, you could say, hey, I'm able to design a car now or at least uh, the basic framework of a car with a very limited set of parameters as an input, and actually I have an uh, AI or I have an application that is uh, then uh, actually designing a framework and that will, will uh, for the car, and that looks completely different than whatever uh, basically engineering departments have come up with. Because it's uh, a um, constant trains around uh, what you can do or what you could do, what you could calculate from an engineering perspective uh, in previous times, right? So that's really become something completely new, something completely new that's great. So let's park the last one a little bit. Um, I want to basically focus a little bit uh, also with regards of the company 
companies uh, I'm seeing, um, let's say the the spectrum between the pure tech side on the other end side and the um, contribution part, if you want to call it that, of AI being part of a broader solution for a specific process for a specific industry. And the point that I want to make again that it's very important. Important, I think, for any company to be clear in what they fundamentally believe the sustainable source of value creation for customers will be in terms of what you do um, and uh, where you are on the journey. Short example, right? Uh, or two cases of, of uh, how a roughly similar story just lands very differently, at least in my ears. Right, so you could. I've come up with a uh, better, more beautiful, uh, more precise, what have you, way of analyzing language. Different languages, different types of languages, written, spoken, what have you. Right, and and uh, you basically explain how this uh, fundamentally everything and and the application space is global and everything is great, right? And then you've told that story and uh, then you say, and what I've decided to do now is basically create uh, a first use case in the insurance claims process um, for insurances in country X, Y, that. And I have decided to now basically go through the tedious process of running proof of concept projects for the next two years until I've somehow that uh, this use case works, and uh, then, is, then that is what I'm going to scale from there. And whenever I hear those kind of stories, I'm, I always get super excited on, on the tech and the opportunity in the beginning, less excited about scaling uh, the insurance uh, uh, claims uh, process that's actually happening at the end. Right? On the other hand side, if you come to me and say, uh, I have incredible domain expertise in the insurance claims process. I know how actually to digitize. And yes, uh, there's an component or there is a key AI uh, component built into how I'm doing that. Uh, and that is how I'm winning. And that, that is what I'm scaling then I understand more directly how what you're currently doing will actually lead to value creation going forward and um, they basically set the path to scale. So I'm, what I'm not saying is that one is necessarily better than the other, right? Um, but if, if you actually bring this together with uh, what I tried to discuss before, uh, the life cycle piece of it. It, it, it means somehow, especially uh, for AI product investment or the, the tech capability might be uh, just uh, magnitudes larger from compared to where the initial business lies, but that it's very important to say, when am I actually consciously moving out of the stage where I try to basically create something that creates value and I try to prove uh, the value of all versus um, I'm now trying to lock down a specific way how this gets a specific value creation logic for a specific type of customers and a specific framework in a specific process and a specific use case, right? And um, uh, many companies, is, it's much because they are starting more from a use case perspective, but whenever you're starting more from a tech uh, kind of logic, um, then basically you always need to be aware of what, from an overall value perspective, the opportunities costs are of taking the step in locking down the first use case and actually trying to just build a business um, around the use case. And I think those are 
are actually the very hard decisions to make um, when you have a uh, business that is more mentally uh, built around new analytical AI related capabilities that might have a very broad application space. And the reason why this is also uh, quite relevant is because how you think about financing during the life cycle um, impacts then also what you do, right? So in, in general, well, when I look at it, is well, and if you're in the idea stage, um, that that's clearly an equity game. Um, also, basically, until you get started, until uh, you have achieved product market fit, you've actually locked down a certain kind of business model that you're starting to scale. Um, it's an equity game. Yes, grants can be in place. It depends always on where you are and, and what is applicable. But then when you get into the scaling up phase, right? You, you actually have a business model and that makes sense. I can make an argument of how I'm getting more customers on that business model. And the whole, whole thing is actually moving also toward a, at least operationally uh, profitable path then I can um, have a broader range of financing instruments uh, put to task against uh, and then have a revenue-based finance, other debt component, essentially because also I have uh, just a much more uh, predictable path forward and of course at some point you reach maturity. So um, again, uh, as you move through that cycle and depending of course, how quickly you want to get to the phase type of business. Okay, uh, that, that defines how long the, um, let's say, uh, dependent in, in a completely objective kind of way uh, on getting uh, equity into your company, right? Uh, it also means if you're basically in a business model, when I look at it from the other end side, I have actually locked in a business model. Uh, I want to come off uh, the financing that I take. Well, if I'm then, for example, a revenue-based finance provider, I'm sure you scale your revenues, right? Uh, because that's where I partake in, uh, in terms of the value created. So I actually, for, for me, it only matters whether you actually, in that use case, perhaps add on one or two more, but um, I take uh, much less uh, reliability on the original uh, opportunity space or the original value creation space that's resulting. And uh, that is, I think, kind of fundamental thoughts, decisions, or at least at any given point in time, uh, a clarity on where do I actually stand and what am I trying to do? I hypothesis on how I'm actually going to move with my path uh, through those different stages and at which point in time. I think that is a super valuable, um, also just self check, and it should be more or less a, a constant reflection um, on whether it, the original thoughts and hypothesis still hold true. Right. So what it comes down to is basically say. Am I actually very clear how do I create, right? And then uh, how does that tie up to what I do that is very hard? And uh, two things, then everything else falls in terms of what is my model to expect my share of the value and actually start growing something. All right. Um, I would be through with that. Um, I hope we have uh, some time left for Q and A. Uh, I've talked a lot, uh, and of course, it would be much greater to uh, see you all. But I hope somewhat um, interesting. Yes, thank you so much, Stefan and Bruno. We have triggered uh, perhaps some questions and. Yes, we have received a lot of questions and maybe we can have a look at them together. Um, people are still voting uh, on the questions and still um, asking people their are still own questions. Voting on questions and still, um, asking their own questions. Asking their own questions. So maybe let's uh, just check them out. So uh, Anonymous asks, um, 
B2B software as a service was a major trend in the last 10 years. However, many startups had troubles to stay independent and got bought by Microsoft, etc. What would it take, in your opinion, to have an independent large AI player 10 years down the road, similar to what Salesforce has achieved in software as a service? So uh, I think, the let's take it backwards, right? The, the reason why Salesforce yeah. was able to grow, um, I think, to the size that they have is actually because they have uh, focused clearly on the domain expertise in a specific function and everything built from there, right? And, and the whole point of um, basically saying, uh, that they had the first mover advantage and actually kind of trying to digitize sales uh, processes and how things get organized around that. But basically, and th that was never interesting for anybody who was in the space of productivity software or anything else, right? It was really kind of a, a new piece of uh, the overall space. And, and that's what they were able to grow. Uh, I think it's, it's simple as that. And um, it, it again, centered on the very specific domain expertise. Um, so on the other hand side, I think, um, yes, that I think is still possible. But, but I think, again, the, the root of it would either be to say, um, I have an, a, dom a final domain that is neglected by somebody else, right, for whatever reason, where it's actually also from it might be huge, but in the greater scheme of things, it's, it's not attractive enough for uh, the large tech companies to invest in it them themselves. Uh, so I think that those are areas where things could develop. I think um, what is still underdeveloped uh, from an overall business model perspective, right? Uh, coming yeah. back to my, now coming to the other side, the pure tech play, by basically thinking about business models where you say, I know how to do the actual tech, the hard stuff, the machine room. I actually fully accept that I do not need to be the one who's building this into the products with the domain expertise. Mm -hmm. But I'm able to set up a way where my tech and my capability can be used in many different spaces, right? And, and the tech actually becomes a standard setter and not the single application in the domain. Mm -hmm. And um, around those kind of things, um, business can be uh, built to scale probably also much harder or uh, much uh, to, 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 to be uh, really big, um, mm -hmm. but it's harder, definitely. Mm -hmm. right? it, it, it's much harder uh, going that route. Mm -hmm. So focus on the tech, not on the application or a group of clients is the way to stay independent also 10 years down the road and also to keep on? I'm, so I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not sure whether independent is a value in itself, right? If, if you think yeah. about it like that. I, I, I think your chances of growing to a huge scale and being independent is uh, being in a domain that nobody has taken care of yet, right? Or where it's hard for anybody else. I think that, that, that uh, if, if you want to have a most predictable path, that's it. All right, all right. No, thank you. This is definitely a, a, a large question, a complex of questions, actually. Yeah. And let's, okay, let us, let us know anonymous if this is a good answer. And uh, the next uh, most upvoted question, um, how do you see valuations at, uh, in AI in Europe versus US and China? So um, sure. I try to make it very simple. Uh, I, I think uh, it, it's not that AI gets valued, right? Uh, business models or at least value creation opportunity gets valued. Uh -huh. So, um, and everything else is either the story not being told with the right angle or anybody being confused. So I, I think it's, this is too broad to basically draw any conclusion by just saying how do companies that have an AI component get valued here or there. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's about the product and the business model. Yes. Um, 
Antonio asks, um, considering the traction of AI technology, could machine learning performance monitoring solutions have a durable spot within this trend? Uh, yes. And, and, and I mean, I think, again, performance monitoring has so many different uh, shapes and sizes. But, but actually, I think that is one of uh, the fundamental pieces where AI will just continue to get stronger and you will almost at one point have no single process, no single decision that at least gets an input from some kind of uh, diagnostic or mon monitoring uh, application that uh, most likely is then also AI spawn. That is what, it's really what I fundamentally believe. And I think it's not uh, perhaps a half sentence on that. It's not mm -hmm. necessarily um, always a question of uh, this needing to be hugely complex, right? So I think it's, it's especially whenever you talk about performance monitoring or also of machinery or anything else, um, there um, is a, the one trend to say I, I put uh, be it physical or otherwise, uh, tons of sensors against something, and, and then I build a huge model, and somehow I try to predict something. Right? On the other side, I had the discussions with guys who are um, basically uh, monitoring production machinery, and they're saying, no, no, no. Actually, my model just needs one single input, and that is the production speed. But mm -hmm. I'm getting into production speed in such a granular level um, that I'm actually able from that one data point extract a huge amount of information, right? And, and, and even that, especially when you, when you think about the complexity of not only being able to do the analysis, but actually how much input do you need? How much investment does your customer need besides to pay you uh, the fee, your fees or your licenses? How much does he need to get ready and prepare? I, I think that's a huge component and the more straightforward uh, and, and easy those kind of performance monitoring uh, solutions are, I think the more success they will have. And yes, and I believe they will be everywhere. Mm -hmm. Great. Then with Thanks. regard to the time, let us pick up the, the last question. Mm -hmm. Oh, for this one, I need a, an hourglass. This is tiny. Wait, let, uh, me, let me help you, Clement. <laughs> <laughs> old, old, old man looking for the internet. I can it's, read it to you. It's many AI SaaS products require consulting in brackets, PowerPoint and coding services before deployment. Uh, investors are typically not in favor of this revenue source. How do you differentiate from an investment perspective between necessary consulting for scaling like SAP and Oracle is doing versus a distracting source of revenue? Um, so. I think um, that part of the revenue stream is a more or less fundamental, almost necessity for a lot of B2B software as a service companies, right? Uh, so I, basically, un unless you're really able to afford to take the costs and um, more or less uh, build it into whatever you charge in terms of subscription transaction value and somehow make the whole uh, equation work uh, fine, but you're actually kidding yourself, right? Uh, you, you still have a business that requires consulting, even if you say it's all baked into the subscription fees. So from an operational standpoint, this is much more, it, it's less about kind of the revenue stream. It's what do you actually need operationally? And of course you should aspire to um, minimize uh, the, the need of uh, consulting or kind of customization or whatever you need to do but that simply does not work in many areas. I think the more interesting discussion around that is, um, do I actually need to perform this myself or what are the right points in time where I'll focus less on trying to do everything via direct sales, but actually build a credible partner network that um, basically keep my revenue stream clean and they're uh, getting the value from the deployment and everything else, uh, depending on what my scaling approach is. So I, I, I think actually uh, running this kind of activity is uh, something that is here to stay, uh, especially in B2B, in, uh, also in B2B software and service, especially when you're um, selling to mid-sized and enterprise level customers. 
So it, it's really just need to differentiate basically how do I want to tackle that on the business side of things uh, from the revenue streams and how do I want to tackle it operationally, right? And I think but, but those are not necessarily the two same discussions in my point of view. And but basically if you try to push in B2B, what of course everybody likes because it's similarly predictable is to run a B2B software as a service like a B2C software as a service, right? It's completely self-serve. Uh, you just do tons of marketing, people on board, yes, they churn out, but actually you almost don't notice because everything just happens um, automatically. I just think the really kind of um, fundamental tools or applications that actually change processes, et cetera, um, will be processes that uh, where a lot of people actually need to change their behavior and you need to steer this change of behavior. And that's where it needs customization, consulting and everything else. All right. Thank you so much um, for this answer. Um, value creation in AI business models. This was a really interesting session. We received too many questions to answer in our short time slot. Yeah, which is a, which is a good sign. Which is always a good sign. <laughs> so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, Stefan Nagel is actually on our uh, matchmaking platform. So you may reach out directly to him if you have um, um, some concrete question. Don't don't uh, spam him with investment uh, requests, <laughs> etc. <cetera>, please. <laughs> we won't come again. No, but ha happy to get in touch uh, and th thanks for having us. Um, and Thank you good so luck much. with the rest yeah. of the day. Yeah, th thanks for joining and yeah, look, looking forward to see you again in the future. All right. So, Thank you, guys. Bye, bye Stefan. Have a bye. nice day. Bye. bye. So, and this brings us directly to our next session, which I'm, I'm very happy about because uh, Women in AI is one of our partner organizations at AI Austria. And yeah, we tried to do something, some bigger event together since actually quite some time than COVID-19 hit. But now finally, knocking on wood, we are able to host our joint session, which have, we have been planning for 18 months. So please welcome with us on the stage first, uh, Sanja Jovanovic and Karina Zehetmeier. Hello and welcome on stage. Can you hear us, Karina Hello. and Sanja? Great, hi, hi. Can you see us and hear us? Yes, perfectly. And um, just for a quick intro, Karina Zehetmeier is the ambassador for Austria of Women in AI and also the founder of Textastic, uh, an AI startup, so to say. But actually, she comes from a background of uh, diplomacy and human rights and ethics. And uh, very interesting to hear your take on the topic of diversity and why diversity matters, because um, let's see if we uh, have the other speakers. Karina, um, I head over the, the main lead to you and I get your other speakers on board. Just a yeah, second. Thank you. thank you so much. Thank you for the great introduction. Um, I would also have some uh, slides to share. Um, is that okay? Of yes. course, you're, you're the boss. Perfect, so uh, share screen. So I hope it works. Give me one second. Can you see my slides? We they will appear soon. <laughs> and of course, to our audience, um, we restart the Slido questioning tool. So please, during the presentation of Women in AI, uh, feel free to ask your questions, and we will uh, answer them in the Q and A session at the end. So um, there is your screen. And Perfect. here are your slides. Perfect. Thank the you. Stage is yours. Thank See you, you so much. So first of all, thank you so much for having us. We are delighted that we can participate in this uh, amazing international conference. Uh, and thank you for a very nice introduction. So to get started, Women in EI Austria, why? Well, as all of you participating today, you know that AI is shaping our present and will even more be shaping our future. So there is great opportunity for all of us. However, there are also some risks and we just think we need to get it right from the beginning and to make sure that we basically create a future 
and technology that serves us all as humanity and every single one of us, we believe there should be or has to be, must be, uh, more diversity. However, yet there are only 22% of all the AI experts pro uh, globally who are women. And this 22% means really from all industries. So not only mathematicians and data scientists, but really from uh, legal experts, ethicists to the, uh, the tech techies basically. So we think there is a problem and um, that is why Women in AI was originally created on an international level but also we here in Austria have the same mission. So basically we are non-profits organizations and we are working towards gender inclusive AI to make sure that AI actually benefits us all and contributes to a fairer society. Therefore, we are on a mission to increase female representation and participation in the field. And how do we do that? So we are an interdisciplinary network bringing together uh, as mentioned before, experts from various fields. And then we come together in groups of different interests and we work on different topics. So for example, one of our biggest uh, pillars is actually policy, uh, where we uh, try to really comment on every policy paper or legal document that crosses our way. To give you an example, we uh, recently commented also on the DSA, DMA, and uh, currently we're looking at the proposed EU regulation on AI. And uh, we also worked on a risk framework for uh, privacy and AI from uh, the UK. And so we are always happy about new topics. So if you have something, just um, let us know. Uh, also, we are active in education. So we just ended this uh, week our Women in AI Accelerate program together with uh, Germany, where we were trying to push female founders to start their startups in AI with AI-driven technologies. And obviously, we do a lot of events. So we are happy to participate and looking forward to this uh, huge event uh, in the future together with Clemens and hopefully also the WKO, uh, where we can shed even more light on uh, diverse topics of interest together. Also, we are organizing, uh, co cooperating in projects, handing in EU projects with other partners, and uh, we have quite some publications, uh, mostly on uh, Medium. And last but not least, the most important part of our organization is really community and network. So we are trying to really bring the community together, have kind of um, events where also less experienced speakers uh, can uh, show their know-how, the things they're working on, like our networking lunches, but also have high level speakers in, in the different events. And then just uh, connect people coming from different fields, but all having the mission to make AI work for us all. So currently, Women in AI Global is operating in more than 150 com 15 countries and has more than 6,000 active members. And here in Austria, we are very active in, uh, in all Austria as, as the uh, organization as such, but we also have local communities in Upper Austria, Vienna and Carinthia. So if somebody wants to open a new chapter, please reach out to me. And um, yeah, basically that's us, uh, or some of us. We are currently here in Austria about uh, 30 uh, women, but we're not only open to women, so we would be very happy to welcoming some uh, men and other gender in our community. And uh, we are uh, reachable here on LinkedIn. You can follow us under Women in AI Germany. We have a common uh, channel and we will be launching our website very soon. Yes, and with this, I'm uh, excited to hand over to Sanya, who will um, moderate and introduce the uh, panelists of the next panel. And uh, now, since um, Matthias actually also mentioned me as a panelist, I'm wondering whether I should stay in the in the <laughs> in the panel as such. But uh, <laughs> so, Sanya, I can you. You can some... definitely stay. I would say. <laughs> Great. You have some background noises, I think. Oh, really? Um, that's not, do the others, Clemens, do you also hear background noise? No, okay, I see we some. We can hear you very well. <laughs> okay, perfect, good. Um, so let me uh, welcome you all. We're so glad to be part of, uh, of this event and also I'm really happy to welcome uh, three or the four ladies in the panel. Um, let me first introduce myself. My, my name is Sam Jovanovic. 
Um, I'm working as a cloud solution architect at Microsoft and I'm also part of the Women uh, in AI Austria initiative that we launched um, uh, a year ago. And um, I'm part of the Vienna team and also the Vienna lead. So um, I would like to introduce our panelists today. Um, we have Gabriele Bulle-Kügel, we have Isabel Klaus, Alexandra Charnau, and uh, Karina, uh, who just spoke about women in the eye. And just to give you a heads up who will be um, present here, I kind of tried to summarize everything what uh, you three have done so far, and it was a lot. So I'm really impressed by all your backgrounds um, and what you have done so far also for the community as well. So Gabriele worked for more than 10, 22 years in the area of IT compliance, primarily at international auditing networks, where she focused on data protection, compliance frameworks, and cybersecurity. Um, she's our vice president of Women in AI Austria, and now she's focusing a lot on artificial intelligence and also um, supporting companies um, to successfully use AI, so a perfect match for today's panel. Um, she's also co-founder and CEO of compliance to be which is a platform um, that allows whistleblowing in companies. So basically employees can report unethical or un, uh, like illegal behavior without a fear um, of reprisal. So basically making sure that everybody who has either seen an incident or experienced an in incident can really um, submit that without any fear of uh, what will happen. Isabel, um, you are very active in the female entrepreneurial scene in Europe, but also beyond, and you're the CEO and co-founder of Thinkers AI. And Thinkers AI is mainly machine learning based technology that uh, defines and redefines the field of web and market research. And what I found very, very interesting is that you have spent um, some time in various countries. So. I saw that you um, completed studies within legal and, and in the business domain um, at universities such as the London School of Economics, Harvard, Dubai uh, University, and also Singapore University, um, and also completed your doctoral studies um, at the Vienna University of Economics and Business. And I think even more um, important is that you were part of the cybersecurity market leader, rather cybersecurity, which, um, yeah, where you actually spent a lot of time being the corporate communications leader and also part of the leadership team. Um, and the startup was announced and rewarded um, as one of the 100 top growing um, companies in EMEA. So that sounds really interested. And I'm super glad to have you both um, on board. And Alexandra, uh, you are a lawyer in the IT IP data protection team at Doda. Um, where you joined 2016 and your main focus is in IT and data protection law um, and everything that is kind of yeah involved with digitalization and e-commerce so um, your work or like your expertise is everything about um, intellectual property unfair competition law and also um, anything legally regarded to new technologies such as AI and blockchain um, you're also a member of Dorda's Digital Industry Group. I'm curious what that is and, and how that um, yeah, fits into uh, also the, the version of um, uh, diversity. And you're also part of the Women in AI initiative um, in Austria, where you're just like working on a lot of um, initiatives with us as well. So Karina, you uh, did your introduction, but basically you're the CEO of and co-founder of Textastic. You're the president of um, Women in AI Austria, and yeah, basically whatever um, has happened within the community here, I think um, you you own a big piece of that. So I think the backgrounds and like the experience that everybody has are very diverse, um, but there's one thing that each one of you has actually in common, which is working uh, towards a more diverse um, environment. And therefore, I'm very pleased to welcome you for this panel and also introduce you to the topic of today, which is why diversity matters both in business and AI. So just like asking um, any one of you who is ready to um, yeah, tell our your opinion about that, 
what do you think about the current status in business? So actually, I would like to start um, more in the like more on the business side and then move forward to the AI space as well. So what do you think about the current status? Is there still is there something like looking back a couple of years ago? Is there something that has been improved already? Um, or are there still some aspects that we really need to focus on in regards to diversity in business? And also, please think about diversity not only being gender, but um, really looking at um, age, backgrounds, um, racial, social, economical aspects, like anything um, that we think of diverse, because as we know, diversity is really a broad topic and can be interpreted in, in various ways. Yes, thank you, Senya, for the introduction from my side. Very happy to join you uh, on this important topic and uh, would like to focus on your question. And I think there are things developing. So it's, it, that's a good thing at the beginning. So we are on a, on a journey in a way uh, and there are things, there are much, there's much to do, but uh, it started. Yeah, and it got much better for the last like five or six years. And, and this is a good thing. The, the thing that we have to keep in mind for the future, and this uh, is for business as well as AI, there will be jobs in the future that are no longer existing. And uh, these are jobs that uh, especially women or other, um, uh, other um, people are, are working in. And uh, we have to react early in order to, to get these people in different jobs. So there's a really a, a, a need. It's not a nice to have, it's a must that, that we go on this journey, not only from a, a company side, yeah, um, but also from a personal level for all of us, for the next generations. So this is just, uh, just the opening um, to say, yes, uh, great that things develop, great that we talk about it and we have some speed um, but there's still a lot of things to do. Thank you. I, I totally share your opinion, Isabel. Um, I do, however, come from a little bit another angle and um, see also diversity as a very relevant and important factor um, for implementing a new technology. Um, why? Um, well, it is documented that lack of diversity, for example, in the field of research, engineering, and so on, may indeed result in, the, in, in a huge bias um, technology on a large scale. So it is very important to also build up a team that uh, works with AI um, that is diverse and um, includes yeah, many um, different aspects. Uh, social, races, um, age, and so on, just to improve also the, techno the, the, the technology itself. So, um, yeah, that, that's um, my statement on this. So, Alexandra and Isabel, I totally agree with you. Um, I think the business models of the future will be more complex and we need to focus more on diversity because the markets will be diverse and we can only um, yeah, en encourage everyone to uh, buy in our company if we uh, are a diverse company and can um, yeah, target a diverse market. So I see that the younger generations are more prepared to have uh, diversity in mind. So the yeah, a little bit older generation, as I have been, um, yeah, we we focus more on on hierarchical structures and not so much on on teams and diverse teams. So I think we need to learn much more from the younger generation <clears throat> and will be successful in diverse markets when we learn from them. Um, I know that, I know that uh, Gabi, you have worked on international projects and I know that Isabel, with your experience, you also were very international. And Alexandra, also you on your side, um, managing and, and advising like yeah, both international and national customers. And my question is more about like, how do you see Austria compared to other countries? Is it something that um, 
we yeah are doing quite okay i would say because i think there's always room for improvement as we know but um, also looking back at, at your experience that you have had a couple of years ago um, i'm just like curious how we are compared to the uh, international status quo Um, I will just go first on that um, because I just have so many <laughs> um, thoughts in my mind. Um, well, compared to uh, the, the past years, I think we have a need made um, a great uh, step forward. Um, however, there are still countries um, which are much more innovative. Uh, for example, U.S or um, the Asian market, they, um, I don't know why, but it's also a little bit uh, depending on the legal framework, of course, what can you do and uh, how far can you go? Uh, but it's also a, a mindset thing. They are uh, more, more open to innovative projects and say, yeah, let's do it. Let's try and to realize a new project. And if we fail, we fail. And if we succeed, we succeed. So that's okay. I, I think they do have a little bit another mindset on that. Yeah, I completely agree. I think uh, there is uh, still some way to go in, in Austria and compared to other markets. As you said, Alexandra, there, there is just this mindset that, that where I guess Austria is not a front runner. Yeah. Um, I guess we do our steps, but, uh, um, yeah, we can do much better and much more. And it's, it's moving a bit slowly in compared to, to internationally. So, um, uh, on the company side as well, uh, yeah, on the company side, uh, the, the focus has to be more on uh, doing things, bringing things to, to, to practice. Yeah. If I may jump, may jump in, I, I actually have something to add also still to the first question, but I think it fits kind of both maybe. So from my background in the United Nations, where I always, which was always my biggest goal to work with an international diverse community, so saving the world, basically. Um, I, I just uh, learned and I think that uh, sometimes at first, um, these topics might, may slow you down because you get different opinions or different uh, inputs or something that might hinder very fast uh, progression on just like developing something. But in the end, to, to make sure that creating solutions, whether they are political level or um, on a technical level to, to fit the users or the people living in the country. I think it's very comparable. You just need to make sure that there are these um, ideas of um, different stakeholders involved. And uh, honestly, it's much easier said than done because as a female founder, I have to confess also to put some spice into the discussion and uh, that, uh, you know, I, I have currently a very um, male uh, dominated team and it was very hard for us like although we were trying to talking to right people but just from the network that how our team emerged it, it, it happened to be now we are seven people and I'm the only woman currently uh, and the CEO but uh, we really need to change that but although thinking about this topic and really wanting to do it we didn't manage but I know that Isabel has a better track record. So um, that's why I uh, also <laughs> admire her. I think I will get some advice on that topic as well. But I think it's really important to have diversity to make sure that solutions work for the users or the humans in the end. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I can add on this. So we are 50% women and 50% men in the company. And um, I'm very also proud on that because there is some work behind it, actually. <laughs> so some really, um, uh, um, yeah, work on that in regard to really in inviting and being present at many um, women-centered initiatives. Um, and also at the universities directly. So often we get, uh, especially the data scientists from universities, and um, we are, uh, 
yeah, also also focusing on getting them early. So if it's an internship or something like this, um, I have to say I do prefer to take the women. <laughs> yeah. And and so this is how we come to 50-50, actually, to be honest. Yeah. And and we are having a big focus on keeping this balance. So this is also a challenge because we grow every month. We we get on uh, new um, employees, so there is uh, some drive behind, <laughs> and and lots of initiatives. And I'm very thankful for initiatives like uh, Women in AI um, because uh, it has to be focused and and you really have to get um, young women to to. To get to know you and to know, hey, there is a woman on top, like Karina, uh, as the CEO, there is a woman, and I can try to 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 go into these companies, especially because they have a focus on women on top, and and this has some meaning. And I'm sure, Karina, it w won't take long <laughs> for you <laughs> to get the next female um, employees. <laughs> So we just had that. I'm sorry for interrupting, but um, I, I have to complete this. Um, you just said that it, you have a very strong focus to elect um, women and prefer women rather than men. Um, well, just for uh, clarification, I, I think we are both on the same side if we say high skills are the minimum, minimum requirement. And, everyone has the same requirements uh, you're going to select the people based on inclusion aspects and diversity aspects but uh, the basis is um, at least having a very high skill being passionate about technology and and, and so on so um, these aspects shouldn't be missing when saying that and I hope we're you're you're fine with that Absolutely, it's just to go the extra miles to reach the females, actually. But maybe this leads me to my next question. Um, do you agree with that or how do you see um, the measurements that companies are taking, such as like um, the ratio of, of um, employing either women or at any like other groups as well, to make sure to, to get more diverse? Do you think this is a necessity or do you think it would work um, without that as well? So when I may jump in in that uh, question, uh, what I think is we can, we should not work on female quotas for um, getting more females in a leadership role. We must work on the mindset of the males too, because uh, we are not better, we are not uh, lesser um, for some of the tasks in the company um, prepared, but um, everyone should um, yeah, see that every human has his own skills and we should focus on what human is the best in that uh, place. So it's, it's not necessary that we have a female quote, so um, I think we need to work on males' mindset so that they can accept if they have a yeah, female chief or head off and uh, work with them together without thinking, oh, there she's not as good uh, trained than me. So I think this is the, the biggest uh, challenge we have today. Because like um, what what I could also tell from from my experience, like if you have those quotas, maybe whoever got hired just like receives or gets the feeling that oh maybe this was because of um, that fact, which is actually counterproductive in the end as well. So I'm just looking at the time; it's eleven, uh, it's almost twelve, and we have a couple of minutes left. Um, well, therefore, I would like to switch topic um, and just move to the AI side as well and and look. Um, into your experience since um, every one of you is working um, not like either technically or not, um, but in the business field of AI. Um, how do you see uh, the current challenges on diversity in AI? I think um, everybody has heard or read about um, like models more like classifying or uh, working more positive towards 
for example, white male um, versus other um, ethical groups as well. So is there something um, that that uh, you would especially like to put focus on, um, especially working in an AI startup or working with AI projects? I think then coming to the technical, <clears throat> sorry, it's coming from the technical side, um, many things start very early, like in school, like the education. And and there, we just noticed during the last year that there is still so much to do, to have these technical skills and to have a, a equal um, um, a balance between how do I uh, act and educate um, women and men or whomever you you address um, how to can I do it equally yeah. and and especially in the technical field there it's a big a big issue which where there needs to be done so much unbelievable much saying that being a mother of two and um, just uh, noted how things happen in schools and 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 how it's communicated and everything that is not communicated or not done or or fostered very early and and I guess this makes a big difference um, to the path that somebody takes in university and later on or other fields so I totally agree with you. So sometimes it's uh, very um, yeah, offensive that women will not be um, yeah, challenged in technical areas as uh, yeah, young boys do. Uh, but on the other side, um, I, would, uh, I would keep you in mind that not all uh, jobs which um, are in the area of artificial intelligence are very technical. So we have so many organizational things to to follow up and um, to to structure data, to to label them. To yeah, there are so many things which are not uh, very technical. I think we as uh, females we can contribute to these jobs too, even if we are not in a technical area uh, on the on the university. There's actually a cool, um, cool uh, comment that you made. Like, just looking at the audience as well, what do you think, or how would you animate more women to join um, to join the the area of AI? Because honestly, like, I kind of yeah um, experienced it myself, and I started to like it, and I saw the challenge, and it was so oh, cool. Let's let's look into that. But um, what's your approach on how to uh, really animate more, like show what the potential is, because I think it's still like some kind of stereotype, kind of stereotype. That, that if you hear it, um, you think it's totally technical and then you compare what you have from your experience and you kind of get afraid of not applying or, or joining this area. If I may, jump in. Ah, no. <laughs> so Gabi and I, we are sharing a room. <laughs> this is where we are having technical issues from time to time, but uh, very briefly, um, so I, uh, I think, or I guess that's, that's what we all think at Women in AI, um, you know, this idea of having uh, role models or just having um, some of us who are not from technical professions, but totally into the topic and then taking decisions on or evaluating uh, risk of AI um, systems or uh, making sure that how we use the data is actually GDPR compliant. And uh, all these topics that are around, um, and there is, a, I think, when we talk about machine learning, we mostly think about the data. And what Gabi said before, there is a lot about um, garbage in, garbage out. And uh, so the biggest, one of the biggest challenges is like, do you manage to have a representative uh, uh, data set that you actually use to? Uh, then make decisions for uh, human beings around the world and does it apply to, can it be applied really um, to the different groups <laughs> that there are and individuals. So I think in these roles there are a lot of roles or in, this, um, in, in these jobs there are a lot of roles that we simply don't think about and that will be a big trend for the future 
But besides that, I think that what Isabel said, like you need to, we need, we are also trying as organization to get some funding, uh, if somebody hears that, to, to actually <laughs> go uh, go to, to schools and try to reach girls. And um, there's a huge problem also with dropout rates from technical universities. So uh, we think that this our network could be great to, to motivate um, uh, female students in um, yeah programming classes, for example, to just like stick it through and uh, see what op options there are. And so I think it's really the, the power of the network to, to reach reach uh, actually mostly women and other groups who have not thought about them in the in the sense of uh, the opportunities that the technology can bring for them in their careers. Nicely said. Alexandra, do you have any um, other input on, on that as well? Um, yes. Um, well, it, it, is, it is very important to have a very good data set. Um, as we already um, talked about it, it's, it's very important having people behind that, um, that or a team working behind a project that is diverse. Um, but diversity is also constantly changing, so it's also important to have uh, or to include a lot of feedback processes to also improve the technology and uh, to be updated more or less on, on the diversity inclusion topics. Um, so um, what today might be diverse and inclusive, um, yeah, is probably outdated by tomorrow. So it's also very important to have, uh, to keep in mind that, to have that feedback processes. Great. And there's there's one topic that I also wanted to um, go into, which is all about like uh, founding a company. Um, basically, we have uh, Karina, Gavi, and Isabel who are the experts on founding, and Alexandra who is uh, the expert on the legal aspects. But um, I actually uh, wish for more female uh, startups, and um, I kind of uh, just thought about buying the the um, yeah the share of, of Bumble because she's a female, and I kind of uh, like that. <laughs> so um, my question for the audience as well is, um, how can we uh, improve or like raise the number of, of female startups? Is it something that is is it actually related to gender or is it just like, um, I don't know, what's what's your opinion on um, increasing Austrian or just, just like worldwide female startups in that point? Well, um, if I may start, um, I guess what I often see is that uh, females, they um, do get more take more um, feedback personally so um, if something went wrong it's because of them you know and and this is untrue and this as an entrepreneur especially uh, you go through all these things yeah meetings that don't uh, um, are not positive um, investment feedback whatever you go through it and you say oh maybe i shouldn't do it maybe i'm not good enough whatever so um, i guess if this is managed and you say and in my opinion and in my experience men can do this much better hey well if he doesn't do it uh, if this doesn't do well then i go somewhere else and try it again yeah so being having a, a much more um uh, I don't care <laughs> attitude yeah, if something goes wrong is so important and this brings you to the next stage and the next level and more and so on and this is so important for entrepreneurs to really to really have this attitude and uh, this if you have it then uh, women have a wonderful uh, environment because there's much support currently and there are much opportunities from any side and uh, you just have to get to this mindset and try it. And and yes, there are other jobs. There, there is another way of living that is more easy. Yeah, being entrepreneur is tough at the end of the day, and you have to do, uh, you have to go through really death valleys and whatever. Um, but uh, it's worth it because you can do so much for for. Um, 
for yourself, for your own path and for others. Um, and, and I think it's worth it. And it's just coming through this. Hey, it's not your fault. Yeah. It's, it's, it doesn't matter if you fail once, do it a second time. Love it. Really amazing. So for all women who are out there, I would, give, would like to give you a very good uh, tip. So try it. If you have a good idea, try it. Um, find a very good uh, business buddy and uh, give them a call every day uh, in the evening maybe or in the early morning to, um, to encourage each other and to get some energy to get the next steps. So that's a very good uh, way to encourage each other and be successful. And also, and also, also yeah. when I learned, also so, when I learned from the TED talk, in case you have something um, before, like in, instead of getting nervous, just like raise your hands like a victory sign, which helps in the end as well. Um, yeah. You know, there's, there's a TED, TED talk to that. Fake it until you become it, <laughs> basically. <laughs> That's what I'm referring to. Um, but uh, looking at the time, we have five minutes left, and I know that there are questions on Slido. Um, so I'll just take the first one. Uh, how do you feel the lack of women in the eyes affecting the AI bias in applications? So I think maybe Gabby, do you want to go first on that? Because I think you also had some work um, related to bias and, and um, AI application development. Yeah, so uh, at the end, uh, in that uh, project we are uh, involved, uh, we can have a look on the uh, data structure and help them to, to see if they are biased. Uh, but to be honest, um, most of the projects are running without us. And what we are doing is that we are on, like today, on panel discussions and uh, bring in our, um, yeah, perspectives and uh, make sure that all uh, who are uh, in the uh, or participate are uh, um, get an, get an um, idea how bad it is if you have uh, biased uh, data because that's not a benefit of a company. If you have uh, trained your uh, very expensive AI model with biased data, and uh, they are not uh, sustainable for the next uh, two, three or five years because of the data. Um, this is not a very benef it's not be very beneficial for the company because it um, costs you much of money. Also also the reputation. And also the reputation, that's right, yeah. Like, and attracting women who want to come to work in your company then, yeah. But um, also like answering this question, there are like tools as well outside that at least help to improve um, the bias in application to check um, how well uh, certain categories are involved or if there is a certain like um, decision made based on based on uh, a group, for example, to just like make sure to kind of really before like anything going in production to kind of um, go through different um, people as well, see, uh, receive feedback. And I think that's that's all like a loop in the end to kind of um, yeah cool, yeah see it from various perspectives as well. Isabel, Alexandra, do you have any other inputs on the question? Well, absolutely. I I noticed um, from the various projects I uh, was um, guiding and advising on that um, the lack of women in AI is. Um, or can be seen mostly in the field of HR, for example, where you use AI in, in the field of HR because women tend to be a little bit more empathic and um, do, do have the, 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 the right feeling on how to say something. I think about chatbots, how do they answer um, specific questions? And it's, it's very essential to, to give them a little a flavor of um, yeah the, the the female touch also 
because these are the, the most relevant fields where also women are working uh, successfully in. So um, I see no more questions. Well, uh, is there women in Asia as well? It's globally, so women in I is uh, represented globally. Just make sure to uh, join uh, women in AI.co. Um, so as Karina also said, there are more than 6,000 members. Um, and maybe in case there's no ambassador for your country, you can also reach out um, to uh, the global organization to kind of make sure to bring the organization back as well um, uh, to your country. And then, uh, yeah, just go for it, plan uh, events, grow the community and do uh, whatever uh, you would like to kind of do. So we have two minutes left. Um, I would kindly ask like every every one of you to, to I don't know, say some closing words and uh, also some advice that you would give or hand over to the um, people attending. Um, and yeah, thank you for that. So may I start? <laughs> I, I would say um, CAI as a new colleague. So he needs to be trained. He needs to uh, get his perspective of the business model of the company. And um, yeah, he needs some time to, to grow. And uh, maybe you can help him to grow and uh, give them a very balanced perspective. Well, my um, last words or advice in a nutshell, um, be confident, don't be afraid to take decisions, just do it. And um, just, yeah, know when to, when to ask for help. It's okay to get help uh, when you don't know how to uh, move forward. Thanks. Yes, I think AI is a... Uh unbelievable opportunity for the future. And as we heard in talks at the AAIC conference be, before, it's a multi-trillion market. Um, so um, please let's all join this opportunity and get the best out of it and let's try it out and um, try things and contribute to um, to the work and, and to society at the end of the day. So um, hard to follow all these inspiring um, uh, closing remarks. So I would uh, quote Nelson Mandela, who actually said, your playing small doesn't serve the world. And I think that's what we should all believe in. So it's better to just try, just do it, as Alexandra said, and um, just give it a try, the new opportunities that AI brings for all of us. And uh, make sure to get it right for all of us, because it only works if it works for us all. And just to say that everyone can join, because I saw the question before, so everyone can join the organization. So there is no limitation to genders uh, or uh, what I, what your profession. It's all about the idea of making AI work for us all and uh, pushing for more equal society and using AI to create this world we want to live in. Thank you. Thank you for the very nice closing. And with that, um, I just hand it over to Clemens again. Yeah, th thank you very much for the panel and also for taking so many questions from the audience. Yeah, this, this will definitely not be the last collaboration we have. So look, uh, can already spoiler the next event we will do together on uh, gaming and AI in Silicon. So stay tuned for that one. But with regard to the time, unfortunately, we have to cut off now. So I, I wish you a nice, pleasant evening and keep up the good work. Thank you so much. Best wishes Thank from Vienna. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. And uh, we will just quickly display our short video before we head over to our next session. So see you in a bit.
All right, and here we are again <laughs> after a short break. And I'm really excited for our next session because we will be welcoming uh, Roland Chow from the Chinese startup Four Paradigm, which has actually been founded by uh, amazing pioneers of the Chinese AI industry. Not to take uh, too much away from the presentation, um, from the interview, which is hosted by my colleague Christian Mehreiter, our innovation officer at our Advantage Austria office in Beijing. For technical reasons, we have recorded the interview, which we will display to you right now. And after the interview, we will try and get a direct connection to Roland Chao and Christian Mehreiter in China. Uh, Nevertheless, you can ask questions uh, during this interview and after the interview, and we will be seeing us again for the live Q&A session in about 15 minutes. So enjoy the interview and talk to you in a bit. Roland Chow, International Business Development Manager of Four Paradigm. This is from the Econ Fest 2021. We're here in Beijing at the Advantage Austria office and I'm together with Anwoli and Chao from Four Paradigm. Before we start the interview, I thought I'd set the scene with a few um, facts about the AI industry here in China. So China is widely considered as one of the um, most important innovators in the field of AI worldwide. So in the last few years, China has published the most patents in this field. And in terms of active AI companies, China is only second to the United States with, as of 2019, roughly 1,200 active AI companies. The field is also like, backed by the government with a lot of like relevant policies. For example, the action outlined for promoting the development of big data and the next generation artificial intelligence development plan. And these kind of policies send an important signal to the stakeholders here in China, entrepreneurs, investors, or researchers, that artificial intelligence is a field that's worthy of um, time, of the money, because it's backed by the government. And so far, it has um, yielded some impressive results. So they are very, some of the largest, most innovative AI companies um, are based in China. For example, SenseTime for computer vision, Unisound for speech recognition, Video Plus Plus, which um, has an interesting technology where they can in real time and dynamically put advertising within videos, place them in appropriate positions. And then there are also companies like Ant Financial and ByteDance that we would not associate with artificial intelligence usually, but they also make heavy use of this technology. And last but not least, there's also a thought paradigm, and we are really um, glad to have you here today. So let me ask and start with asking you, what is a thought paradigm? Like, what is it standing for and what is it all about? Maybe you can give us a brief introduction. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Christian. I was really glad to be here participating in the AIC conference. Um, so let me start introducing a bit more about Ford Paradigm. So Ford Paradigm is a full-spectrum artificial intelligence company. So we provide AI-related consulting services, tools, and algorithms to support enterprises who are seeking to transform their businesses with AI. Our company is founded in 2014. We have now grown to a team with about 700 employees, and we just completed our D fundraising of 700 million US dollars. Many people ask why is our company called for Paradigm because it yeah. sounds like a very interesting name. Why is that? So, yeah, and it actually comes from the work of Dr. Jane Gray, who is an American computer science, scientist and Turing Award winner in 1998. And he proposed that our human scientific learning process have gone through three stages in the past, being uh, observ experimental, observational, and second being theoretical, and the third being computational with computer science. And now in the 21st century, we are in the data science stage. And in this fourth paradigm, uh, we make use of huge volumes of uh, data sets uh, okay. to make new discoveries. Um, and that's how the name of the company comes from. So, so the role that Ford Paradigm as a company uh, want to want to take is to support companies to, to find direct values from the data that they own um, and generate. We often see that uh, a common problem that com uh, companies might have is that there's simply too much complexity uh, in the data set. Okay. And it's very difficult for a human business analyst to capture all of that value because there could be millions, trillions, or um, trillions of uh, numbers of connections uh, yeah. within and in between data sets. 
So here is where AI algorithms comes in because AI can achieve a level of calculation complexity uh, much higher than human beings. And for Paradigm, we want to give companies that AI capability uh, to be able to derive the hidden value uh, within their data sets. Okay, interesting. So basically, maybe tell us a little bit more about how for Paradigm started, what was your initial product? Mm -hmm. And then did you have to like um, pivot and change it uh, over the years as you discovered maybe uh, different ways of applying the product or like the technology? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for Paradigm, it's a relatively young company. We're only six years old. Our, our CEO and founder, Dr. Dai Yuan, he was the principal architect for Baidu's AI system called okay. Phoenix Nest. Uh, another founder, Chen Yuqiang, he was the, the designer of ByteDance uh, recommendation system, which is the developer of TikTok. Yeah. Um, another founder, Dr. Yang Tiang, he's the, uh, the world's most cited AI scholar in the field of transfer learning, uh, which is an emerging field of AI. So that founding team has a really strong um, academic thought leadership background, as well as uh, experience applying AI in businesses. And actually from the uh, beginning of their entrepreneurship, they are, they are very clear that they, they don't just want to build a few AI solutions here and there for specific industries or specific business processes. They want to build AI platforms or a middle platform tool that empowers our client companies to have AI capabilities themselves so that their AI or technical team can grow together with us uh, with our first several projects. And eventually their team can build models themselves and react to new business scenarios. Uh, apparent, and apparently supported by the kinds of um, proprietary technology on for Paradigm's AI platform. Yeah, so maybe it tells us a little bit more about the typical uh, use cases that you see with your clients. No problem. After about our first couple of projects, so maybe we can start from there. But overall, Paradigm is industry agnostic, which means that we really get involved in the wide range of industries. But we started with finance and banking. And our first client was the China's Merchants Bank, which is a global 500 bank and the world's top 10 most profitable bank. And we started with them in 2014-15. And at that stage, the banks haven't really started implementing AI holistically into their business processes. And we select the specific scenarios of installment service precision marketing just to see how AI models can perform better than their expert rules, pushing promotion messages to their uh, potential customers. And then the result was actually really good. The average click-through rate and revenue increased by about 60%. And they're so happy with the result that they decided to really rethink their retail banking strategy, their credit card services. And then since then, they have been working with our team until now. And, and their uh, AI model building process is built on uh, for Paradigm's platform called Sage. I can, I can also maybe talk about another example. Absolutely, yes, yes, please. Yeah, so overall, if we look at all types of cases that we have, they're roughly in three categories. The first is customer engagement, which help our client companies create very customized experiences for mm -hmm. their customer. So you really are providing a thousand different products to yeah. a thousand different customers. And the second type is risk management. So that includes anti-fraud uh, transactions for, for other banks yeah. uh, or predicting maintenance for manufacturing um, companies or internal risk compliance control, etc. And the third type is operations, which is generally automation of processes. Okay. Yeah, and I can give you an example that we have had in the retail industry yeah. uh, for customer engagement. Um, we know that retail is really a hard hit industry uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic. Yeah. And only uh, in China, only those uh, brands that has Design their online channels in a smart way. We're able to survive through the 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 pandemic. Uh, yeah, the pandemic. And uh, Young China, our client, uh, which owns the KFC and Pizza Hut brands yeah. um, in China, is a good example of this. Um, they now generate roughly about eighty-four percent of the revenue from online channels. Okay. Yeah. So how did AI help uh, in their digital process? So for one thing, when you take your business online. Uh, your marketing process, your, your offline coupons and promotions turn into in-app digital coupons and yeah. promotions. And AI can enable uh, precision marketing. And how does it how does it do that? It means that you don't send one standard coupon to every uh, customer at the same time, but you send uh, very customized coupons with different okay. amount of content to different people according to their various attrition risks, their yeah. demographics. 
their behavioral traits, uh, and all of those are calculated based on the, the data that you own uh, for this cu these customers. And in an another example, the retail, uh, the recommendation system we built for KFC can also generate personalized menus. And actually, if you only have an ordinary digital menu, the, cost of the average uh, order value that customer can actually drop. And that is because the customer might find it annoying to browse through the long, complex uh, menu yeah, themselves yeah. without any personal interaction with in-store assistant. And, or they might just search for the specific things they have in mind when they open the app, yeah. and, and they don't get anything else, uh, so that the, uh, the OV, the average order value is lower. And AI comes in to um, help solve that problem. And so with a, with a personalized menu, we, we rank those products that the customer might be most interested in on the, on the top. We want to please and attract the customer and at the same time promote your new products and services that the, of new products and meals that the customer hadn't seen before so that we really optimize the experience for customers to make orders um, and also um, provide a similar kind of interaction they would have with assistants and in that way maximum. Maximize your AOV. Okay, interesting, interesting way to yeah, individualize uh, the offerings. I thought maybe we can talk a bit about implementation. So it's interesting mm -hmm. to hear these use cases, but I think it's also interesting to learn how, when you go to a company, how you start implementing these, these kind of projects. So how do you usually, when you, when you talk to a client about implement, implementing a new project, like walk us through the steps a little bit and what you typically tell clients, what they need to be aware of? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. To, to avoid the pitfalls of implementing AI, you definitely need to choose the right methodology. Yeah. And at Fork Paradigm, we often engage with our clients who are the pioneers of their industry, and they are working with us to experiment uh, new AI scenarios. So we, so we have a specific methodology called 1 plus N uh, for exploring new scenarios. So the 1 means the process of identifying a specific process where AI can really make a significant impact, even if it's only generating an incremental improvement as low as 1%. Okay. And in the case of KFC, their average order value has been increased by only about 2% after the model has been implemented. Okay. But that has been able to help, help them increase their revenue by millions, hundreds of millions of yuan. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. that's an appropriate scenario for, for KFC in China. And uh, we move on to, and then we move on to the N, which means to expand your AI model uh, application to to n number of, of uh, processes, and that's considered uh, holistically with the AI strategy and the different transformation strategy that the organization has. Okay. And the common problem we see with proceeding to the N part is that there there's simply not enough AI talents and resources to support uh, your process because we, we know that the AI talent, top AI talent is really rare at this stage. And developing a well-designed AI model can take as long as months. And within, if you design it in-house, you mean? Yeah, yeah if you okay. design it in-house without any external support or, mm -hmm. or appropriate platform okay. tools. And so that's why for Paradigm promotes a platform strategy, because that platform can help engineers, even if they are not top AI talents, can help our IT specialists to be able to com complete the model development process in only weeks or even days. It, it compresses the process from data preparation to the design, the, the building, and the use of, of the AI models. Okay. And uh, typically, the, your contact person within the companies, are they more like the, the C-level people, or do you prefer to work closely with like, the operations team? Like, who would be your ideal uh, vis a vis in like a uh, client's company that you want to talk to when you um, try to implement the project? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. So actually, from, from both sides. And from the top down, you should see implementing AI as part of your appropriate strategy. So that yeah. involves a higher level people to get engaged. And from bottom up, it's, it's definitely a collaboration between your IT team and all your relevant business specialist um, business lines. So what we often recommend our clients to do is to assign a CAIO, a Chief AI Officer, okay. <laughs> and that person it will be in charge of designing 
their AI strategies. Think about the relationship between AI and their overall business model. How do you integrate、um, AI and a closed loop data system into your overall、uh, tech, tech infrastructure? How do you put together an AI team that's a combination of your internal employees and external support, supported by appropriate AI tools and platform,、um, and how do you acquire? And、uh, make efficient use of your computing resources. So we consider it important to have、uh, that role, either as a combination、um, of internal or and、uh, and external people, or you dedicate、uh, one CIO in your organization to coordinate all that.、Problem. The way I understand it is like for implementing these projects, everyone needs to be on board from top management to like operational people. Maybe even have a dedicated person in the company that helps to coordinate all these changes.、Mm -hmm. Okay. In general, do you also have like other specific like suggestions for clients wanting to implement the AI? What they should think about beforehand, or like、mm -hmm. any other like pitfalls or, or mistakes or issues that maybe they should be aware of, like before you try to implement the project at all? Actually,、mm -hmm. yeah, I would say first think about using AI as a corporate strategy. Rather than applying, so rather than bringing a few AI solutions here and there in a scattered way, for sure we we know that AI is going to disrupt some industries, just like how the internet disrupted paper、yeah. media decades ago. And so AI implementation is not only about、uh, getting a few models in; It, it's more a holistic、uh, okay. design process. And so you need to. Think about where to start with, where to have your one, and and how to expand your end scenarios in more considerate way. And second, I would say think about how you want to build your AI team. What kind of people you want to get involved? How many?、Uh, what kind of internal people should be there, and what kind of external support you might need, as well as the kinds of platform and tools. And that should be. Really balanced based on your evaluation of your existing processes and existing capabilities. And third, I would say when you actually start implementing AI, make sure to build your data set system that's in a closed loop system, so your model is capable of continually improving itself by receiving feedback. And you because you need to tell your model how well it did. Uh, for itself to、uh, automatically、okay. react to new situation, and also make sure that you have planned your computing resources intelligently, because that can be a costly part. And that for Paradigm, we promote a software hardware integrated solution to to minimize your TCO, your total cost of operations. Okay. Okay. Well,、um, these were a lot of interesting insights. Maybe just the last quick question to wrap up. You were mentioning that、uh, for Paradigm, it's very like industry agnostic, so you're、mm -hmm. open to a lot of industries. But you mentioned retail and banking. So far, for use cases, are there any other industries or use cases that you're looking forward, like in the future, to be like more to be more engaged with and like soft issues in these other industries,、mm -hmm. like supply chain, for example? Yes, that's an, actually an area that we're、okay. looking at.、Um, we have realized our client requests have become you know, more more complex. So a supply chain scenario is actually one of those、uh, complex situations that involve a combination of.、Uh, High-level AI algorithm. So, in the supply chain scenarios, we help clients decide、um, how much they should produce each day, and how many products they need to dispatch from the factories to their stores. How do they select the location of their stores? So, the process is really a combination of many AI problems, and that involves machine learning, deep learning,、uh, reinforced learning, and environment learning, which is a very exciting problem for our AI engineers and scientists to look at. Okay, great. And I believe our audience can also like reach out to you if they have more questions or want to discuss these issues in more detail. Thank you so much. It was very insightful. And now back to you, Matthias. Thanks. Thank you. Hello, Matthias. All right. Thank you so much, Christian and Rolin. And、uh, now we see if we have actually a live connection、um, to our Beijing office and to、um, to to Rolin Chow. Let's see. Hello, Christian. Can you hear us? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Hi, Matthias. Wonderful. Now live. <laughs> And hello, Rolin. Can you hear us as well? Yes, yes. Hello, everyone. Calling from Beijing. Really glad to meet everyone online、Hi. in person. Ni hao, Beijing. Really great、yeah. to meet in 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 real life, as I always say, because this is really、uh, our life in the last year:、uh, virtual conferences. <laughs>
<laughs> and uh, thank you so much for your input. We received many uh, comments and uh, some questions that we want to have a look at together now. Mm -hmm. So let's pull them up for a second. And um, well, let's let's uh, let's start with the first one. Um, your co-founders are AI pioneers. Do they still have active roles at uh, for Paradigm? Yes. Yeah, maybe that, uh, that, that question is to you, Roland. Maybe you can. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, I'm not the person in charge of tracking our co-founders' uh, daily tasks, but absolutely, they're very engaged in the daily decision making. And I often see our founder, Dr. Dai Wen Yuan, in one of our meeting rooms, um, actively thinking about uh, what's the next steps for AI yeah, applications and in various business scenarios uh, mm -hmm. in China. And also, our co our co-founders, a lot of them have very a deep academia background, so they also lead our research and develop teams to constantly um, develop new models that that uh, to to meet the challenge of business complex business scenarios. Mm -hmm. So still developing and researching. That will, yeah. It's amazing because they have been actually really involved in so many famous names that we know uh, from the AI industry in China that you mentioned in your interview. And uh, let's see, we have a. The next question, um, yeah, well, somebody asks, uh, do you have a consulting or sales team in, in, uh, in Europe or the US? Yeah, correct. So actually, we started our international team in Europe at the start of 2020, uh, right before the pandemic, actually. Um, and because of that, our expansion has been slow but steady. And we are actually now really looking forward to connect with clients or partners in, in Europe and US to to explore the market together. And we do realize that as we have strong technology and products that has, has been through many implementations in China, the market situation and demands uh, outside of China would be very different. And we respect the experiences of our existing, uh, of, of the partners and the market leaders there in Europe um, to work mm -hmm. together and see how we can best leverage AI. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because we heard so many times today that uh, yeah, implementing AI has to do um, a lot with uh, uh, having a perfect understanding of uh, both domains of the business that you're working with and of uh, the AI services you're developing. Yeah, interesting. And, um, yeah, and also to add, also to add, we understand that there are certain requirements that comes from the European market. So for example, we have taken the effort to make sure that our Sage AI platform complies with the GDPR requirements of Europe. And mm -hmm. so in terms of identity and access management, we have made sure that our product is designed in a way that uh, protects users privacy. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. we, we really respect that and think that's fundamental to any uh, of our activities. Um, in mm -hmm. Europe. Oh, that's, that's, that's anyway something I would also have wondered about. Thank you. So GDPR compliant uh, data handling. Um, another question that we have, um, well, a, a similar direction. Your role is international business development. In which regions has for Paradigm uh, so far expanded? Mm -hmm. So we have five offices, offices globally and have two international offices, one in Singapore covering the APAC region and Southeast Asia, and one covering EMEA, uh, Europe, Middle East and Africa, which is based in Amsterdam. Um, in Amsterdam. So currently, yeah, so currently those are the regions that we are um, pr prioritizing at the moment. And we are very open to having discussions uh, with either resellers or solution partners or um, IT um, providers who, who mm -hmm. might be thinking about how to strengthen their own solutions with AI, um, or maybe we can collaborate on projects together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe one follow-up question to, to this one on your international mm -hmm. locations. Do you also have international engineering teams? Uh, or is we it are sales and consulting? So our research and development teams has um, its presence in Singapore at the moment. And we have started thinking about collaborations with local universities. Um, the progress in Singapore office um, has, has had a little more progression uh, since the pandemic. Um, but we really hope that uh, we can still either operate and enable our corporations from long distance or be able to survive, uh, be able to really go get over the pandemic. And, and get more actions taken in Europe as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, there's, there's, there's actually a similar question to yours, Clemens, in the chat. Um, how many employees do you have? And how international uh, is your staff, uh, your staff, uh, maybe like percentage wise? <laughs> uh, okay, statistically, <laughs> yes. Yeah. So overall, we have over 700 employees. A majority of them are in Beijing, now headquarter in Beijing, about 500 are in Beijing. And I think internationally, it's not a huge, uh, it's definitely not a huge proportion and a majority of staff still in, in China. But we're looking to uh, expand our international team. And um, many of our staff has studied abroad. And so they are aware of the, um, the business and the market needs abroad would be, would, could be drastically different from the, uh, from the China market. And mm -hmm. I think with those back knowledge, um, we, would, uh, we would definitely be really open to hiring more local talents and uh, to integrate our uh, business uh, models with the local ecosystem to work together with universities uh, or um, organizations and, and, and to explore the best way forward and grow our team. Mm -hmm. Well, one organization that definitely keeps on working with you is our Advantage Austria office in, in Beijing, <laughs> <laughs> connecting yes. Austria yeah. and Chinese companies. We are already at the end of our time slot, but I want to thank you so much for your input. Uh, Rolin and Christian, um, we wish you a nice evening and an enjoyable weekend and hope you are still available for maybe some contact requests that come over our B2Match meeting platform. Yeah, absolutely. Please feel free to reach out to me and we can have more conversations afterwards. Thank you, Clemens and Matthias and Christian. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Good evening to Beijing. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Well, it's really back on back today, but um, Clemens, we have uh, one of the highlights saved up for uh, the last and fourth day of our conference. Oh, yes. Who will indeed. be joining us? Indeed, indeed. So it's our special pleasure that for the last day of the conference, we could uh, convince uh, Sepp Hochreiter. Um, you, you convinced him. Yeah, yes. uh, we <laughs> ma majestic plural <laughs> 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 to join us. And uh, yeah, I mean, it goes without saying that SEP is in the Western Hemisphere definitely, or in general, one of the most famous and impactful researchers in the field with papers dating back to the 90s or most recently with, with, with Rudder. And uh, SEP agreed to, on the one hand, show us like what is currently going on in AI trends, but equally important, also on a European level, he will talk about Alice, the Excel, the, the research network of excellent centers for AI, where Linz is also one of the outposts there. And yeah, to, to give, give a little bit insight on this, what is going on on a European level. So we, I think we already see him here. So yes, uh, let's see if we have a connection. Hello, Seb. Hello and welcome. Hello. Hi. Per perfect. P picture works, sound works. Perfect. Uh, should I start to share my screen or? Uh, yes, um, you can you can start to share your screen at any time, and uh, as soon as we have the presentation, we put it on stage. Yeah. So if you press on present mode, it we flip it on. Perfect. And here we already got something. Yeah. Uh, we will see each other in a few minutes for the Q and A session. Um, to our audience, uh, please feel free to reach out to uh, Professor Hochreiter in the chat on Slido. Uh, we will ask him your questions, the most popular ones, in the end. So, see you in a bit. The floor is all yours. Uh, uh, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm going uh, to talk about Alice and uh, what is uh, building up in Europe uh, these days. Alice uh, stands for European Laboratory for Learning and Intelligent Systems. I have problems to switch to go forward. I'm trying it again. Now it's working. Uh, a background uh, uh, of Alice. Uh, machine learning, uh, uh, as you know, is at the heart of the technological and uh, societal AI revolution. What you read in uh, uh, newspapers, uh, it's all 
driven by machine learning or deep learning. But problem, uh, most of the stuff you're reading is from Facebook, Google, and so on, uh, meaning Europe is not keeping up. Most of the uh, famous research uh, labs are located in America, in the West or uh, East Coast. Uh, it's not only the research, all uh, good PhD schools uh, in, in the States. Uh, on the other hand, if we look at the money, AI investments are mostly done, or the high sums are done in China and in America. And uh, these investments are significantly higher than what we see in Europe uh, these days. Therefore, academic institutions are struggling uh, to retain their best scientists. It's the same uh, with my guys. Either they go to Google or Facebook, uh, they get a uh, good off, uh, offer, or they go to Enlight AI, also a very famous uh, company. Uh, and it's hard to keep these guys at uh, academia. And what also is developing, uh, it's getting more attractive for these guys uh, to leave academia because uh, uh, the distinction between academic research and the industrial labs, if you think about this Google Brain Labs, is vanishing. There's not so much difference anymore. Perhaps there's a difference. Uh, uh, industrial labs have much more compute uh, and more uh, women power to uh, do the big experiments. That's the situation uh, uh, we perceive uh, in Europe. Everything is scattered. You see these islands. Uh, uh, we have these universities, and within the universities, uh, this machine learning or AI groups, but nothing is connected, uh, 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 nothing is organized. There's no common uh, uh, movement how to coordinate AI research. Uh, in Europe. And this should change. I hope this will change. And it started with the Alice letter. There was a, a proposal. It was in April uh, 2018. Uh, the idea was labs, uh, which outstanding facilities and a good track record, uh, should be uh, able to recruit the top scientists. Don't leave them go to the States uh, or China, don't leave them move into industry. We also need good research. Uh, it comes with a high hiring bar. We want to have the best ones. Here, excellence is priority. Uh, we also uh, uh, think about long-term funding, competitive salaries, even uh, we now have to compete with industry. Low teaching duties, if you always uh, stand uh, in your classroom, you cannot do high-level research. Also, uh, build up the connection to startups. Uh, 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 fostering startups uh, should be facilitated. Uh, and we want to go together and do joint recruitments and evaluations uh, across whole Europe. Uh, and also, it's about fellows and students across Europe. Let's do uh, uh, things together, workshops, summer schools, or PhD programs. That was written in this uh, proposal. It was the first step uh, uh, towards what we now see as Alice. Uh, the idea was to establish something which is similar to AMBL. Uh, AMBL is a European Molecular Biology Laboratory uh, with some uh, locations across Europe. And it's a really high prestige uh, organization. And, uh, uh, most of the biological or biotechnological research is done at these labs and they are very uh, uh, well funded, uh, have good output uh, concerning research. And then in December 2018, uh, at the NeurIPS conference in Montreal, uh, you see the guys here, the Alice Society was founded. Uh, this was a founding a meeting, very early for Americans, but a good time for us Europeans. Uh, and this is uh, a photo of uh, the guys who signed uh, the Alice uh, Society uh, Foundation, uh, who uh, did the first step towards founding the Alice Initiative. Now, 
Uh, here, uh, Alice is already established. Here's the Alice board, uh, uh, the board members with uh, Barbara, Nuria, Bernhard, and Max, and uh, deputy members, Matthias, Andreas, myself, and Josef. Uh, what's going on within Alice? Uh, what we want to do, uh, what are, are our goals, aims, and so on. Uh, there are uh, these pillars. First of all, attract and enable the best minds. Uh, we want to make resource positions within Europe attractive. And the idea is uh, tal uh, talent breeds talent. Uh, good people uh, uh, draw other good people, uh, educate other uh, 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 high level uh, researchers, uh, and we want to keep talent within Europe. So second pillow would be uh, create a regional ecosystem around leading AI research uh, groups or institutions. Uh, the ecosystem uh, should uh, comprise startups, new companies who want to go into this uh, topic AI research, established industry companies locally uh, which want to use AI and in particular machine learning but also academia and uh, all uh, uh, institutions from society. So I should come together and uh, uh, move forward uh, AI research and research in machine learning. The third pillar is uh, bring Europe's leading AI hotspots together. You saw uh, there were the scattered islands. Why not working together? Why not making a strong brand? Why not be proud to be in Europe and doing good research and doing uh, a good application of AI and machine learning? And then uh, if also industry and startups, if this ecosystem exists here, then we can keep also good scientists. We can keep everything. And what we invent, we can directly apply, we can directly uh, uh, bring it into uh, products, we can uh, bring it into the markets, uh, we can uh, uh, create um, more. Here, uh, Alice's mission, um, it's about Europe. Uh, there should be the best basic research. Uh, 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 we are already very strong in basic research. Uh, we want to keep this, but we want to go to one step ahead, one step further, also uh, brings this basic research into industry, into SMEs. Uh, so I want to uh, should pick up these new technologies uh, uh, to improve their uh, processes, their workflows, their marketing strategies, whatever. Uh, we want to enable Europe to shape modern AI. Modern AI, it's machine learning, it's deep learning. And modern AI is changing the world. We want to be part of it and not only be observers, not only let America or China do everything, we also want to have a voice. We also want to uh, be part of this world shaping technology, deep learning, machine learning. And I already mentioned it, build a local ecosystem for machine learning, uh, uh, meaning we should have different locations, uh, 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 a grid across Europe where every company has some very good research institution connected to Alice nearby uh, to get advice, to get uh, newest information, the newest technologies, and uh, to uh, get pushed forward. We're also uh, are aiming at uh, having with these new technologies a positive social and economic impact. We want to help society, but also uh, uh, want to have economic uh, uh, effects, positive effects. Uh, for example, we want to create new jobs uh, in Europe, uh, create uh, new uh, uh, businesses, uh, 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 want to bring in uh, new technologies in already established businesses and companies. How it's implemented. 
what we already have done. What's right now? We have here the three main pillars. Uh, LS Fellows program, LHPD and postdoc program, and LS sites. I will go uh, through all these three uh, pillows. Uh, LS Fellow programs. Uh, uh, first of all, LS Fellows, you see, uh, uh, this is marked in green, uh, uh, spread across Europe. Uh, in light green, uh, you see uh, we are uh, the only members. Fellows are the senior scientists, the high ranked scientists, uh, members. Uh, uh, scientists which uh, participate in uh, this top tier uh, uh, conferences and since they are supporters for supporters you don't have an excellence bar uh, you can be always supporters supporters uh, uh, it's on in yellow uh, and it's uh, colored in if there's a fellow you get the green if there's a member but no fellows and you get light green and if there's only supporters uh, you get the yellow and you see we already covered Europe very well uh, uh, some uh, uh, gray spots uh, we see in Eastern Europe and uh, so on, but uh, it's well uh, developing. We are growing, we are growing fast, perhaps we're growing too fast. Objectives for this fellow uh, um, uh, initiative, for this fellow, uh, Alice Fellow program. Uh, we want to bring together as a best. Uh, uh, scientists, uh, senior scientists uh, within Europe uh, in AI machine learning. Oh, it's not only machine learning, it's also related uh, uh, fields like uh, vision, uh, robotics, uh, and natural language processing, stuff like this. Uh, it's not only core machine learning, but also all these application fields. We want to bring together the best scientists in our field, so they should talk to each other. Uh, in the fellow programs, we uh, want to focus uh, the research on high impact problems uh, to use this uh, modern technologies, modern AI, machine learning, deep learning to solve uh, 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 urgent problems uh, we have uh, identified. We want to focus on really important problems and not uh, some niches uh, where we cannot make a difference. Uh, all this fellow program is inspired by the CIFA program. It's a Canadian program. This Canadian program was very successful uh, uh, where Joshua Benjo uh, is uh, a leading scientist, but also Jeff Hinton uh, uh, initial, uh, initialized this. Uh, and uh, CIFA is a raw model for us. Uh, and we also collaborate with CIFA. CIFA also gave us the first inputs, the first reviews for the fellows. Uh, it's about fellows. Again, fellows, uh, we want to enable an intensive scientific exchange. All these islands I showed you should work together. Uh, we identified important research areas, important application areas, and all the guys should work together. And this across institutions, across countries, and so on. And uh, this fellow programs, uh, the uh, research is uh, dedicated to uh, relevant topics. Uh, here I uh, listed uh, list some of them. Uh, it's of course basic research, the theory and uh, the algorithms behind uh, machine learning, deep learning, but also application areas like health and life sciences and also uh, very active right now, climate and earth sciences. Also, I don't know whether you know that Linz is leading in uh, uh, models for hydrology, models for climate change. Uh, even Google is financing research in Linz because uh, application of machine learning, AI, in climate and earth science, uh, we have the lead here. And also uh, human-centric AI, uh, uh, there are fellow programs, research programs on this. Here is uh, the list of uh, the fellow programs, the research program. The geometric deep learning, it's about uh, graph neural network stuff like this, but also equivalent stuff, uh, robust machine learning, 
interactive learning and uh, interventional representations. Uh, this is also causality. Uh, uh, it's also uh, covering uh, reinforcement learning. Machine learning, computer vision, that's basically computer vision group. Robot learning, that's uh, 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 so, robo, uh, so robotics guys. Human-centric machine learning, that's what I already men mentioned. Uh, then the so, so core theory algorithm and, and, and uh, computations of modern learning systems. Uh, quantum machine learning and physics-based machine learning. It's a very, very active uh, field, also quantum computing, using quantum computers for machine learning. Uh, uh, natural intelligence, which uh, uh, gives the connections uh, towards uh, cognitive science, uh, towards neuroscience. Alice Hales, uh, we are also part of Alice Hales. Uh, uh, everything was, has to do with uh, health, uh, bioinformatics, uh, and using AI systems uh, in medicine or health systems. Machine learning in Earth and climate science, I already mentioned it, uh, natural language processing, and also symbolic machine learning, which is more so connections to, so, uh, to the traditional AI, uh, uh, like it was rule-based systems, uh, uh, expert systems, and stuff like this. We also include that. This shows the Alice Fellows and scholars, uh, fellows are the senior researchers, scholars, uh, uh, very high level researchers, but uh, they don't have the seniority, which only is measured how long is your PhD uh, uh, passed. And uh, this is a fellows and scholars. This is our best researchers here in Europe. And uh, you see uh, it's going across uh, Europe. What is sh uh, shown here is the numbers uh, tell you how many fellows per 10 million citizens. And what you see is uh, Switzerland has a high rate, uh, there's a high density in Switzerland of good researchers, but also, uh, also in Israel, uh, it's a, a bottom right, you see it, and UK, this is uh, uh, what we see. Also Finland uh, uh, has a very high uh, number, but all other numbers are quite uh, distributed. Uh, we have, uh, about uh, 280 fellows, but they're increasing. Uh, right now, I think we have, uh, 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 it's going towards uh, 400 uh, because uh, each fellow, if you want to become a fellow of the Alice Network, uh, you have to go uh, into a review process and only if uh, you get uh, a bar, across a bar by meeting all the criteria, uh, you uh, become a fellow or a scholar. Interesting. And here, uh, Austria, uh, we have, uh, uh, we were very successful. Uh, for example, uh, uh, I came to this with the Alice units. Uh, Austria uh, could initiate two Alice units. Uh, it's in East, uh, uh, of the Institute of Tom Hansinger, in Kloster Neuburg, and in Linz, which was. Uh, Quite surprising for all other countries that Austria is so strong in AI to get two units accepted, uh, uh, while uh, in Germany uh, there are only few more, Switzerland only gets one, and also Cambridge and Oxford uh, could not make it in the first round. So I made it in the second round. Uh, I'm still at the Alice Fellows. Uh, what is the goal of an Alice Fellow? Uh, it's about uh, uh, to promote and exchange ideas, uh, uh, to create a, a European community of top AI researchers, and also think about uh, new developments, new trends in AI, what's going on uh, in the research field. Uh, very important, retain and attract talent. We want to keep talent in Europe, and we also want to uh, uh, draw them uh, to Europe. Uh, also, what is the role of Alice to advance science, of course, and also act as an ambassador of Alice, uh, what I'm doing right now, uh, uh, telling what Alice is about, uh, bringing uh, Alice uh, to everybody, to companies, people, and so on. Uh, also, uh, to provide strategic advice and leadership within Europe, uh, especially in the local uh, uh, ecosystem, uh, and also stand up and fight for European uh, uh, interests uh, uh, 
and also generate uh, international visibility of European uh, uh, researchers. And so fellows, uh, it's very focused on excellence. Uh, here we see the median age index of fellows, it's uh, 53. Uh, there are other uh, uh, AI organizations, but Alice isn't focused on excellence. Uh, we want to have the best researchers and the best researchers team up with industry, the best researchers uh, team up with startups, the best researchers uh, try to make uh, PhDs, get the best guys into the PhD programs. It's about excellence. The next pillar that was about the fellow program is the LS PhD and postdoc program. Uh, it's clear uh, it's about education. We want uh, to keep the best and smartest young researchers in Europe. And that means attract and support excellent young researchers in machine learning. Uh, and we also want to coordinate all uh, graduate programs, also PhD programs across Europe by a uh, meta program because uh, as a PhD uh, can only be given by university, but we can coordinate. Uh, we uh, put on top an LS program, the best PhD students should be LS PhD students. Uh, and that's a European col uh, collaboration. And uh, again, the focus is on excellence. Also in the uh, PhD program, we want to get the best ones. So they should not go to MIT. They should not go to Stanford. Uh, they should be uh, uh, stay in Europe and work with us and uh, push forward uh, these uh, technologies. Uh, the idea is for the PhD uh, uh, doing joint supervision within the LS network. Joint supervision means uh, you have supervised as a PhD student from two different countries. And we want to become the number one brand for PhD for education in machine learning and AI. Uh, the program uh, uh, is already set up. Uh, uh, there's uh, joint supervision. Uh, for the joint supervision, you need one fellow or scholar, one of these uh, high level guys, and a second one, which is a fellow or scholar or, or can be member. Member means you basically publish in the main conferences. And there should be collaboration and exchange. There's the academic uh, track uh, where you uh, stay for six months in another academic institution abroad. You have to go to another country. And here, very interesting, uh, we also established the industry track. In the industry track, uh, uh, you also have to stay six months within the industrial partner. You have to be in the company for six months. And the nice thing is the company don't have to be in another country, can be in the same uh, uh, country, but which uh, what still applies, uh, the second supervisor in the company have to be a member. Uh, you have to have a member in your company and then you can be part of a, a PhD program where the guy is uh, uh, six months in your company. Uh, and uh, uh, the only requirement is 50% of the time it should be in academia uh, because academia is, is uh, uh, giving us a PhD degree. Uh, for this PhD program, you have a central uh, uh, recruiting uh, uh, system in place. Uh, this is once per year. Uh, it was in December for PhD uh, uh, positions uh, where all the guys around the world can apply and then we make a matching process. Perhaps uh, the PhD uh, positions in uh, ETH, Zurich or uh, Cambridge are already full and then uh, these guys can go to Linz, uh, to Tübingen and to Berlin or whatever. Uh, there's a second uh, a track where you can uh, enter the LS PhD program and that's by nomination of advisors. The advisors have to be a fellow or a scholar and then you can directly enter this LS PhD track. Uh, but uh, still uh, the rules apply. You have uh, to stay uh, six months. Soon it would become one uh, year abroad. If you're in academia or for industry, you have to be six months also in the company. Uh, currently we have uh, 41 PhD students uh, and postdocs in this track. Uh, we had the first uh, central recruiting. Uh, 
uh, where we had uh, 97 Alice Fellows, which served as advisors. And uh, these fellows came from uh, 16 different countries and uh, 70 different institutions. And we got uh, PhD applications. Uh, so there, uh, I think uh, it's finally it was 1,600 uh, uh, applicants uh, from uh, 70 different nationalities. Uh, it's China, India, uh, uh, Russia, uh, everything you can think of. Uh, also, uh, so America's. Uh, South and North America. Uh, now I'm going very shortly into the last uh, pillar of the Alice. Uh, it's the Alice sites, it's the Alice units, uh, the Alice units, Linz's Alice unit in Austria uh, and um, uh, in Kloster Neuburg uh, 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 East uh, is uh, the other Alice unit right now. Uh, and this is a nuclei of uh, scientific acceleration. Uh, Excellence. Here, the top researchers are located. Uh, also, uh, since LS units uh, serve as ambassadors or as persons in the LS units for LS, uh, they are the anchor of LS locally. You have local units, all companies, uh, so, uh, social uh, 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 institutions have access, local access. Uh, they should be uh, active scientific contributors. So, uh, in science and co uh, collaborators within the Alice network. They are well connected, but there's a local anchor. We have uh, many local anchors uh, that everybody has access to the Alice network because of this local Alice units. Uh, that should be uh, leadership within their local ecosystems and ecosystems uh, in terms of machine learning, deep learning, AI, and they're working on the national level. Uh, uh, here, this Alice unit should create uh, working environments, research environments, where the top talents don't go to the uh, America or uh, China, but stay here and say uh, uh, they can do nice uh, research and can work here. Uh, and we want to uh, uh, get a critical mass of excellent people also to be visible, uh, really to, to change something. Uh, also, Alice units should support startups in industry and also society. Uh, so this is local anchors of Alice. Everybody should have access to Alice via this local units. This are uh, the units uh, which were already established. Uh, this is a uh, 30 Alice units. Uh, uh, Linz, here is Vienna. It's uh, actually close to Neuburg. So there are two uh, in the first chart, two uh, uh, Austrian units, which was a big uh, surprise for everybody that Austria is in the lead in the AI. Nobody was expecting that. Uh, if you look at the LS units in terms of uh, computer rankings, uh, uh, this is a 20 uh, top uh, ranked institutions uh, in terms of uh, computer science. And all these institutions have an um, LS units. Uh, you see them in yellow. Uh, only few of them are right now not part of the uh, LS uh, network. And uh, we have different committees. Uh, I uh, very fast switch over this. There's a fellow committee. Everything is reviewed uh, by uh, top researchers. Uh, nothing is like, because you know somebody, you get in. Uh, now uh, everything is about excellence and uh, you have to go through a, a review process. Also for the units, there's a side committee, PhD committee, uh, also diversity committee, because we want to bring in uh, uh, both um, uh, more uh, women and also uh, uh, more variety across countries and ethnic groups. And that's the coordination office. And uh, with this, I would stop and I'm here for questions. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank yeah. you so much for your presentation. We received a couple of questions and we want to dive right into the questions we received on LinkedIn. Um, this was quite early in the presentation, so let's see. Um, uh, how do we get more European VCs and the wider investor community to invest more in AI startups? We lag, we lag substantially. Uh, what do you uh, think about this question? <laughs> yeah, uh, but uh, I, first of all, I have to say, uh, probably it's not my expertise, uh, but uh, uh, there's, uh, 
I, I will answer this uh, question uh, wider. I, I give you an uh, example. I was in the States. Uh, I met some guy and uh, asked the guy, what are you doing? Yeah, I'm, I'm working at McDonald's. And then we were talking with the guy and let it uh, turned out, yeah, uh, he's studying electrical engineering. Uh, mm -hmm. If I go and uh, I meet somebody in Austria and say, what you're doing? Yeah, I'm studying uh, electrical engineering. And after some time, uh, the guy would say, ah, yes, and I'm working at McDonald's. Uh, so mindset was different. Uh, if you ask them, uh, 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 so I, uh, thinking about how uh, can they make money, how, how can they do something? And also here, if you if you invent something in Austria, if you invent something in Europe, perhaps you can become professor. Hey, now I can become professor. If you invent something in Silicon Valley, you said, hey, now I can found a company. I can make a company. I, I, I can make money. So mindset is uh, different. And that's a problem because the mindset is different. Also, the money flow is different. In the States, if you have uh, uh, ideas, the guys in the mindset immediately give you money uh, to build it up. And here you go, have to go to committees and another committee and you have to do fulfill this and that. It's ridiculous. Uh, so the guys don't give you money. They want to make sure that you're successful. Uh, uh, it's a different culture. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. The culture is different. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I don't know how to improve this. And this has to be improved from the guys who give some money but it also has to be improved from the guys who start something. Uh, if you uh, 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 cannot uh, rewire the brains, uh, it doesn't work. But also our system in Europe has is at advantages. I'm not sure whether we should uh, uh, imitate what's going on in the uh, States. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this, this is a deeper rooted uh, answer to that question that probably is too short. Uh, we have too short of time to get into that probably. But it's a lot to do about culture, mindset. Yes, it just just one second because uh, Ruth is a, obviously studied the Alice homepage. Yes, and this is, <laughs> now it's, it's very good that she brought up the top the topic of the open call that Alice is running at the moment. So we will distribute this afterwards also to all participants. It's the call specifically aimed at SMEs. Mm -hmm. uh, perhaps I should say, uh, look into this now for some uh, 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 company startups, you get some uh, uh, money and also uh, uh, scientific advice uh, uh, to get in your technology, take it. Uh, it's a big opportunity to kickstart uh, your business. Excellent. So now we head back to the Slido question. Let's see, we, we are a little bit over time, so maybe we just take one or two of the most popular ones. I think you answered the first one. Um, how do you want to attract talent to Europe? Because you mentioned that you have a similar approach like the Canadian CIFAR program, I think. Yep. Do you want to add something to that? How do you want to attract talent to you? No, I already said this is, this is a pillows uh, a fellow program, PhD program and the uh, uh, units. Uh, uh, put uh, all our money onto excellence. We want to be excellent and say, keep all the guys here uh, and attract them here. Mm -hmm. well, the, the next question is actually one. Oh, that, that's nice. A personal question. How did your passion for AI start in the beginning? Uh, 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 that's, uh, AI was for me in neural networks. Uh, I started computer science in Munich. But it was really boring. I didn't uh, uh, go to the uh, classes anymore because it's so boring and uh, trivial. And I was uh, in more in beer garden. Uh, uh, if you don't know what beer garden is, uh, check it uh, in internet. Uh, 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 and then I stumbled over uh, interesting stuff. It was uh, uh, some uh, practical work in neural networks. And also there, uh, Jürgen Schmidthuber came into the game. And there, uh, the first time I saw something, hey, it's not things which are known for 50 years. Uh, there's new thing uh, you can try out, you can get uh, uh, your mind in, uh, new, uh, you have new ideas. And that was interesting. So that was the first interesting stuff because all other things was old stuff, 50 years old, uh, uh, and there was nothing new to discover. And neural networks was really new and cool. Great. Thanks for pointing this out in such a vivid way. I must say, up to the beer garden, we share the same CV. Just afterwards, the past <laughs> somehow. <laughs> somehow <laughs> never Probably you didn't met uh, Jürgen at this point. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, this, this brings us to the end of this session. 
uh, really, s s thanks a lot for, for joining us and also especially sure. on, on such a short notice. We will make sure to distribute everything you talk just now, the presentation to the participants and also the call to action for the SME call that is out. And yeah, we, we would be more than happy to welcome you or one of your uh, fellow Alice members on one of our next events again. So really, sure. thanks a lot to Linz and for taking the time, Seb. Okay, yes. Uh, thanks for having me. Thank you so much. And have a good time. Stay healthy. Bye-bye. 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 Great. Well, and today, really back on back, we have uh, now something that we have been waiting for all week. And uh, let's, uh, let's get let's get it on yeah Clement. let's 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 get it started i mean two days ago uh for those of you that have have joined the session there was already the introduction of the aaic hackathon so for the first time we are carrying out a hackathon in parallel to the aaic the hackathon is run by left shift one so you also know from yesterday from the ecosystem day then atos i think no one in europe needs explanation who atos is and from sclabel Clable, you definitely know from the AAIC logistics. And these three companies uh, agreed to, let's say, carry out the hackathon together with selected companies. We did not open it up completely because it was sort of a trial run, but it's companies from the entire DAC region. And today we have with us uh, Gerald, Dr. Gerald Bader from Atos, Patrick Hartreiser, the CEO of Left Shift One, and Dr. Charles Dietz, the head of AI and data, data scientist at Sclable. And they will give us a walkthrough about the results and also show the specific cases which have been uh, carried out over the course of the last couple of days. So yeah, without further hesitation, I hand over to the, to the three masters of ceremony. Thank you, Clement. So I think Patrick, you are going to share our slides. Yes, it did. Wait, let me let me pull them up. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Good morning. Still good morning in some countries. Good afternoon. Good evening. Great to have you again back to our presentation of the results of our hackathon. I think now it's time to lift the curtain to show you what we have done the last three days together with our partners and also with the company. Uh, I think I can obviously say it was really a work, hard to deliver here, but on the other end, also for sure, much fun. Uh, I think it made fun all of them combined with hard work. To give you a baseline of what was it about and what happened the last three days, we will have in our session on, on Wednesday. We started with four companies, four companies from different industries, manufacturing, public institution, food and beverage, startup company. So I think this was the baseline to have four different companies, which makes it quite, quite interesting because four companies means four use cases, four different use cases. So I think this was the challenge to have four companies with four different use cases, four different baselines, bring all this together and to do this hackathon. And I think part of it was now to have these four companies, four use cases, four mixed teams, we had teams coming from the companies, from the clients, from ATOS, Left Shift One, Scalable, put all these people together in four teams, in four project teams, finally, and to deliver something. To deliver something really in this just three days. I think this is really amazing what you can do in just three days with the right people, the right team on board. And if you can pull everything together and say, what was it, what we delivered, I think it's clear. A success. But this is what we will shoot to you in the next few minutes. All of these four MVPs were delivered successfully. The companies, uh, I think, are pretty happy what they have seen and what they have got out of the hackathon, and finally what they can bring back to their to their companies. Because finally, the goal was to really develop and implement something the companies can use and industrialize for themselves in their home environment. And now let, let's get started to make it really short and simple. Let's start with the first use case from Festo, manufacturing company, and show to you what we delivered there. Philip? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for your introduction. Um, Patrick, if you switch to our slides. Oh, perfect. Ah, okay, perfect. So we are basically in the IT field uh, where we try to make ticketing smarter. 
the handling of it. So the goal is to uh, speed up the process of who gets which ticket. So uh, how does the use case look like? So basically, um, there uh, email comes to the system. It can be in any of the languages, in many languages. And our goal is to classify um, the email in one or more labels. So it's a multi-class, multi-label. So it could be two things simultaneously uh, in the same time. Um, and if you go to the next uh, slide, I can show you how it looks like. So basically, the, the data comes as an email. It says something like, hello, Adam, hope everything is fine. X broke, how should we proceed? Uh, by the way, it wouldn't be nice if we updated the system by something, best regards, et cetera, et cetera. Some signatures, some, some other emails may be attached. So you can already see that the, that the data is very messy, right? Uh, you can see some typos. You can see some unnecessary information with the greetings and uh, uh, the footer, the signature. So all this comes to, uh, is in our data set. So we spent some time for pre-processing and figured out how to uh, extract the most important information of, 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 of this incoming uh, message. Um, and then we take this message, classify it. For example, here we said, okay, it's a new feature request and a replacement order just uh, to, to see how it works. So that's how, that's the solution. And in the next slide, I can show you a little bit more about uh, what we tried and what we did. Uh, so basically we, we, we made a, a baseline, some educated random guessing. Um, then we tried some more of the classical feature engineering approaches with TF, IDF, and some uh, methods, uh, models like a support vector machine or random forest. We also played around with the more uh, newer approaches and state-of-the-art approaches with the neural networks, with embeddings uh, and, and, and transformer, for example, BERT. We also tried to automa automatize the, the, the spelling correction or the translation. And at the end, we achieved the results which are 10 times better than a baseline. Um, we're quite happy with the preliminary results which were just done after a couple of hours of training. And uh, we will continue working on this in future because uh, it can save a lot of time and can be used in many different companies and fields. So it doesn't need to be manufacturing, it could be anything. Thank you. Thank you very much. And. Um... Next uh, use cases from, from, from Charles, maybe you can st uh, start. Yes, thank you. Can you hear me well? Very well. So the next use case was brought uh, to us actually by the University of Graz. Uh, it's called the Smart Exam Planning uh, System. So what they were trying, what they need basically, is a whole new system that helps them planning and scheduling the exam sessions that takes place at the end of the semester. So I think for, for people a bit more familiar with uh, operation research, you know, it's one of these classical scheduling planning problem, which is not new, but which is still always difficult to handle uh, for reasons that we will see. I'll show the next slide. So what was exactly the motivation from the University of Graz regarding this? Um, first, I mean, generally they would like to improve uh, the experience that the, use, that the users actually, their students have uh, over the semester when going through the applications to the course and to the exams and having also better scheduling. There's also an underlying goal, which is also to try to improve the sustainability of the campus life and campus operations, uh, which is related to how you allocate certain resources. And also the process itself is still largely taking place manually. It's done by many different parties. It's uh, done at a central level, by central administration, it's done by the institutes. The resources themselves are also distributed. There are several layers distributed in different ways, also like large shared resources and small locally available resources. Um, and also usually by the end of the semester, just before exam session, they'll have to deal with lots of last minute changes, which are again, always handled manually. So it's, it's, pretty, it's a very tricky um, process uh, especially from a perspective of a user experience. And um, of course, the interesting underlying uh, goals would like to see how you could you maximize actually eventually the attendance of the exams and courses and see if what is related to actually the success rate. Uh, of course, there is a stake there. So, but for the hackathon, we have very real practical problems. Um, the, 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 the project, the problem was not so very well specified and you see it's pretty very huge thing. And also were delivered data, which uh, did not exactly support the simple possible solution we could think of in the beginning. So what do we do? Next slide. So the first thing we did is uh, to not panic. 
and uh, then basically during the um, and follow you know <laughs> good good usual method and uh, which actually was played in two tracks so on one hand um, there was a uh, data scientist from Atos and myself we work all along with a customer directly to do the ideation and a more detailed scoping of the problem so we try to identify what are the user groups uh, the high level requirement needed for this solution I already try to drive a high level sort of solution and also maybe a little bit of vision, you know, long-term vision of how this project and system could be like uh, for, for the several years to come. And also try to assess the project. But as I say, uh, there are some very, very hard problems. Uh, and like first, the technical problem itself is difficult, but also the user acceptance is extremely critical for a problem like that, um, that we know from experience. And then on the parallel track, um, actually a data scientist and a software engineer from Lashy Fund were actually based on the very early understanding we had of this use case, try to prototype a solution. So as mentioned, they had the problem that the data were not exactly suited for even the simplest formulation of that problem. So what they did is basically mock some of the data, simulate some extra data sets so they can work on and try to implement a prototype of a solution. And they went pretty far actually. So they simulated some data, they built, actually designed a quick prototype of a planning engine and then integrated and deployed it along with the AIOS um, uh, suite for, for, for ML ops. So they had, uh, sorry, I don't have a nice, very nice visual there, but I have like a little pipeline where basically the conditions are met, the scheduling is done, and then the final schedule is being sent by email or, or provided to a PDF to the users. So that's how far we went. Next slide. So for all the results, the little uh, a much better scoping of the use case, better definition of the problem and uh, risk assessment. Uh, we provided to the University of Life a set of IDs and recommendations uh, in order to move on with the project. And of course, uh, there was this prototype uh, made with AIOS that was delivered. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, then, Craig, your turn. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, our third use case um, was focused on automating the report generation in the area of pet healthcare. So Anivari, the company we were working with in the past three days, offers the possibility to check a pet's health status based on animal hair analysis and combined with a questionnaire to collect additional information like uh, the breed, the age, the size, uh, and the weight and tons of additional uh, parameters of, of the pet. Um, this enables Anivari to create health recommendations and a nutrition plan. The uh, evaluation of the data and the creation of a corresponding health report usually takes about 30 minutes per animal. So this is where AI comes in. Uh, during the last 72 hours, um, an engine was developed to read and to link the available data and to create this uh, health recommendation and nutrition plan automatically. And this just in a few seconds. Uh, this report is not just created and thrown over the fence uh, to the animal keepers. Uh, there's always the human in the loop and Anivari is able to review the report and of course adapt the report um, before it's been getting finally created and sent to the to the customers. Uh, but if this report can be created manually, why are we doing this with AI? Um, the question, the answer is quite simple because it enables Anivari to concentrate on what is their conviction and passion. And this is that your animal is doing well uh, by collecting and processing larger amounts of data. And this is what we enable at them now. Uh, the accuracy of the recommendations can be continuously improved and by enriching this data with additional information like geographical or environmental um, influences, it also gives a lot of new possibilities. So the next step would be to develop an AI model that, for example, enables uh, identification of deviations or uh, recognizes regional uh, peculiarities or inflections due to diet or exercise you do with your animal. Uh, the list of um, things to explore is very, very long. We have a lot of ideas already discussed with Anivari, and we are proud to be part of the journey we are doing with Anivari. And while talking about the journey, 
let's move on to the last uh, use case we have in the hackathon. Uh, Patrick, may I hand over to you? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah. Now let's uh, look at the last use case, uh, prediction food and beverages recommender. So eight out of 10 products in this area are not listed in the supermarket in the long term and disappear from the market again. So, however, this product still must be produced in small quantity and costs money in production, marketing, logistic, and so on. So, go to market is a physical test market in Vienna and in uh, Frankfurt and test new products in their stores. Here we have the data from sales, ingredients, packaging, demographical data from, from the customer. And the test customer fills in questionnaires. And what is the challenge? Can AI predict the likelihood of purchase based on demographics data from the input data? And can AI explain the reason why this uh, product was bought? Yeah, yes, we can. So we analyzed 25 chocolate bars by using AI. Five deep learning models were developed for each chocolate bar in uh, 72 hours, and as well as uh, explainable AI models. Uh, and uh, the result was with an accuracy of, six, of 96%. We can use AI to identify in the first step which persona buys which item and what were data mining the features for the purchase. So, um, as can be seen in the example, the age, origin, regional references, health, are data mining features for the chocolate bar. Basically, with a natural intelligence, we can make this connection ourselves. But if we can't prove anything, um, you have to believe everything. By using AI, we can now prove on this basis of data that uh, there is a connection between uh, um, 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 this data. So, the next steps are, uh, to link the AI models in the AI operating system with the CRM system, Odo, and the GS1 data. Secondly, to support the surveys with a digital assistant. And the last, we'll, we will expand the product portfolio and the data diversity. And yeah, let's bring me to the end. Thank you very much for these 72 hours at Atos, Left Shift One, um, for the employees, also Sklaber. I think it was fun. Uh, thank you very much to our customers as well. Thank you to, to yeah, Clemens and Matthias for, for, for the possibility that we can do that. And hopefully um, we could show um, some other company it's possible to do things in a very, very short time to evaluate what is possible with AI. Yeah. Um, if you want to connect us, please at LinkedIn. Um, and yeah, now I'm handing over to Clemens and Matthias. Thank you very much. So yes, congratulations. That's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Hooray. <laughs> I, I, I wish you were in the room because this is typically the point of an event where you celebrate the hackathon results with a pizza. But here, <laughs> here virtual pizza has to do. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I really hope that uh, we will be able to conduct a similar format in one of our upcoming events. So prob probably not the one in June, that might be too early, but let's say something <laughs> in the second half it's of the year. Two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if there are any, let's say, results you would like to share, like the current presentation, also what Gerald has shown two days ago, what was the structure of the hackathon? How did you find the, the cases and the companies and so on? Uh, it would be great if you could put this all together, let's say, in a presentation so that we can share it with all 2,000 participants. Of course, you yeah. Know, we can do, do, it, yeah. Do, do good and spread the word. It's like in the Bible. <laughs> and yeah, with, with, with this, this also brings us to the, to the end of this session. I mean, unsurprisingly, there were not many questions related to the hackathon. It was more related to how could I join next time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we will, we will tell you <laughs> next time how to join. Yeah. yeah. How to how to open up that hackathon? Mm -hmm. This is yeah an organizational challenge, but I'm sure you are up for it. <laughs> that this could be interesting, yeah. Especially if you go into certain verticals again. The more the merrier. Yeah, yeah looking forward to it. Also, if you want to let's say publish some of the results, feel free to use the channel because this is this is the content we are here for. You know, this is interactive. So thank, thanks a lot to all of you. And yeah, we will now come to the closing words of this of, of the AAIC 2021. So thank you guys. Wish you a nice day. Thank and you. Bye. Bye. Right, the, the, the closing words. Well, 
Clemens, I, I actually wanted to ask you what's your um, two, or th let's say three, if you want to give two, that's okay, but the, your main takeaways, uh, learnings from this Applied AI conference, mm. after seeing so many keynotes and discussions. Uh, yeah, I mean, one big fat disclaimer, this is not scripted so it's not like yeah, I, didn't, I, did, I didn't tell him i didn't tell him that i will ask that yeah it's it's not like we're patting ourselves on the shoulder and say oh this was great we had you know kpi one two three and this is gigantic this is also true but <laughs> <laughs> now when it comes to the main takeaways i think uh it's very i mean it shows doing an event online is very good for the content. I think it would be very difficult to make such a content-driven format in an offline setting. If you just think of the investors panel or the United States session on the first day, or even all the corporates and organizations we had on the ecosystem day and, and before that, I think this is not something you can pull off offline. So in that regard, I'm a bit curious how this will play out in the future once there are offline events possible again or hybrid formats. I mean, you mentioned this already on the first day. I think we will really have to come up with a new format with in, in, in order to avoid to have to scale back the, the quality of the content, like breadth and depth. Yeah, second, you asked me for three, so I give you two, you know, cutting cost. Uh, the second one, uh, What's interesting from an organizer's point of view, because we had the AASC 2020 last year, and in between we had events for uh, AI, Applied AI and Forestry Timberwood, Logistics was in February, and, and FinTech. So, and this is now the fifth one that was taking place online. And what we can see is that uh, the degree of interaction between the participants has increased a lot. So basically, the number of meetings booked per, by participants. Oh my God! No, I'm using in KPI. Oh no. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, but but still, it was very interesting to see that uh, online conferences started as the let's say a digital conference. You know, just like as it says and in in the name. But nowadays, it feels more like a hybrid between an exhibition and a conference, and. I think this is something also to keep in mind for future events that the, the ability to connect for the participants with each other without our in, without us intervening is very important. So I could totally see that this is going in the way of a good co community is a big word, but let's say at least in, in terms of having a persistent web presence where people can connect with each other and not just uh, spot wise on events. So thanks for listening to my TED talk. <laughs> no, how, how, how about you? Well, um, my really key takeaway, as we heard in so many um, talks and keynotes, is well, AI has really achieved a position where you can say it's really everywhere, and um, it's not it's not something that you uh, add to your organization or your processes as a kind of uh, additional cart that's going next to you. It's something that really disseminates into uh, the core of your structure. So that was really interesting. Um, discussing AI as something that uh, has to be considered from really a, a business model perspective. After all, it's all about uh, why you do it and not how you do it. It's about yeah the the, the, the product market fit, and this uh, has been shown in all the discussions that we had. Then again, I see uh, AI um, becoming so ubiquitous that I think we don't have many applied AI conferences left. <laughs> AI will be um, maybe maybe a technology that is just to be found anywhere. And the actual problem that you're trying to solve with it will become more important. Um, but until then, we really want to promote the use of AI in organizations, in companies, and want to connect those people who do it right. And yeah, our mission is not finished. 
Yeah, I mean, this is now normally where I bring the cheap shot of saying make Austrian and European AI great again. But as we have just heard from Professor Hochreiter, it is already great. So we, we want to yeah. keep it great. And uh, also uh, thanks to you, Clemens, uh, and to AI Austria for organizing this conference together. Uh, we had a very small team. <laughs> thanks yes. to... Um, you're, you're looking at the team. You're looking at the team and to my colleague René Wokroy from Advantage Austria. And of course, to all our Advantage Austria colleagues around the world. Also, special thanks to our uh, partners, Network Development Hub, the US Commercial Service, AI Cluster Bulgaria, the EIT Manufacturing Network, and the many, many members of the European Enterprise Network that have supported us uh, greatly in the organization of the uh, over thousands of B2B meetings in this week. Thanks to you all. And yeah, uh, may, yeah maybe one, let's say, ha ha housekeeping comment. All of the talks are available for re-watching either on LinkedIn or on YouTube, but uh, every participant will also receive a follow-up email. So th this, is, th this is covered. The same is true for the presentations in PDF format, but here we are, I don't want to overpromise because here we are also, let's say, restricted in, in who of the speakers is actually giving us the slides. This is, yeah, this is normally around 50%, so don't expect more. Yeah, we'll ask them all um, to share it and then we share it with you. Um, so please make use of that. And we can't uh, repeat that often enough, probably we'll receive the question some uh, multiple times. <laughs> um, well, thanks again to you. And um, well, let's wrap this up, Clemens. Yeah, thanks a lot. And see you on June 17th and 18th for the AAIC on Applied AI in Semiconductors. This means like from companies coming like TMSC, Qualcomm, Infineon, up to startups like GraphCore that you've just heard before from Atomico. So stay tuned and yeah, hope to see you soon again. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.